What is up, Fizz fam? Welcome back to another live Ask the Expert, actually, Ask the Expert live q and believe that's the title. Guys, happy Saturday. If you're watching us live, welcome. Let us know you're here by dropping who you are and where you're from in the comments. And we'll say hello to you here in just a little bit. If you're listening to us on podcast, thank you so much for tuning in. We are just doing like a podcast recap and the channel's growing. Thanks to you guys. I really do appreciate that. Uh, if you're listening on the podcast, this is a replay of a live Q&A that we did uh, that we do every Saturday from 10 to 1230 Central. Most Saturdays. I'd say the majority of Saturdays. Some Saturdays not, but the majority of them we do. Guys, how was your week? Let me know. It's a short week. And I'm running on this theory. I'm working on a theory that if a holiday falls on a Monday, the rest of the week if, of that holiday week are Mondays. Period. That's just what it, if the holiday falls on a Monday, rest of the week, Mondays. Let me know what you guys think about that. As always, at noon, 12 o'clock central. So, you know, in a little bit, a couple hours, we're going to play this week's Week in the Life episode. Let you guys get a sneak peek into uh, what that looks like, what's going on there. Also, huge contest announcement. It's, it's a good one. I think it's a good one. I think it's a good one. I hope you're going to think it's a good one. And to preview it, if you want to be sneaky, the description, I included the link in the description, but don't, I mean, you can, but come back. We're going to talk about it. All right, here we go. I teased it in last week's Week in the Life video, and uh, the comments came back quite a lot. So you guys enjoy watching the end of the broadcast, and I appreciate it. The, the true Fence fam watches the whole videos, and I'm here for it. I like it. And so... This contest is going to reward you guys to stick around to uh, the end of the videos. Hopefully. That's what we're thinking. We're trying to figure this whole thing out. We're, so I'm a fence guy that tries to figure out technology. And I'm surrounding myself with technology people. So we're getting better at it. As you can see, the stream quality is getting a lot better. The production quality, much better. Because we're bringing in legit, like, non-fence people. They're tech people. Braden's a tech person. He's not a fence person. Now, I say that, however... I was out. What day was that? Was yesterday? What day was that? That was yesterday. Uh, I was out. Look, we were doing some work over at the Springfield Cardinals, replacing some gates for. Them. I show up. Braden's helping with the gates. Well, all right, good, good on you, Braden. We do need to video it too. So anyway, Braden, Braden's uh, kind of becoming a fence guy, kind of. Even though we hired him to be the YouTube guy, he's also, which I think that helps for better talk. Anyway. Back to the top. Kelly was here before the stream started. It's like a contest lately between Kelly and Roger to see who could show up first and leave the first comment and then come back and leave the first live comment, I think. Anyway, Kelly wins the day today. I'm here, Joe. Hello, Kelly. All right. Then, then Roger's right there. Hello, Joe and the rest of the Fence fam giving us a wave. Roger, thank you so much. Check this guy out. Fence Industry Podcast with Dan Wheeler. Dan, the man, what is up? Good morning, Fence fam. Welcome, Dan. Dan and I and Dan and Cannon with the My Fence Life show. We've got some big news. We're going to be uh, teasing out starting next month. We were all, uh, we're all kind of on a call yesterday, and we've got some big news. Can't release it yet. It involves, uh, well, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll tease it out as we go. Hello, Bash from Washington. Hello, Bash. Look at that, Doozy Ben. I like that as a username. Roger, uh, what is, so the question, what I, so in the chat, what I say is, uh, let us know, let us know you're here by saying hi and where you're from. So Roger says who I are and I am from here. Well, Roger, welcome from here. Well, from there, really, you're not here, you're there. But I get the point. All right. CNS Vinyl Fence, same here, brother. Technology is out of my depth. I'm trying to learn. I'm here to learn. And we're we're getting the we're getting stuff figured out. If we ought to do that, like a throwback video day of like the beginning days of this YouTube channel. And I think we have come a long way, I believe. Now and that's not to say we don't have a long way to go, but we've come a long way. I've here's the thing. I think you should never stop trying to improve, right? Even if 
when I when I'm at conferences and I'm talking to guys that have massive channels and massive followings, and I'm like, these guys have it figured out. When I talk to them a little bit about their shows, they're like, yeah, we're really trying to figure this thing out. I don't, we've got. I'm taking this course. I hired a coach. We're we're almost there. We're getting there. And I'm I'm sitting there going, well, from my perspective, you're at the top of the mountain, but from their perspective, we're still yodeling up all the way. So. And I think that's funny because you see that with fence guys too, right? In the fence guys I talk to, uh, talk to some, I, I get through this channel, I get to have some really interesting conversations with some really interesting fence fam. Some of these guys and gals run massive operations. I mean, it, and, and these are the companies that you see in the industry publications, you see them receiving awards every year and, and you're talking to them or I'm talking to them and, Again, from my perspective, they've got it all figured out. So I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to get it figured out. So I'm talking with them about, you know, Matt Warner about culture. Great example, right? So from my perspective, he's got that nailed. He's got it figured out, dialed into perfection. But when you sit down and talk to Matt personally, he he'll tell you, he's like, I'm really trying to figure this out. I we've got a few more things to figure out. We got a little bit a little bit more to go. Then I think we'll be closer, but always trying to figure stuff out. I think that might be a hallmark to a successful contractor, not to step on the toes of Mark Olson's uh, YouTube channel. If you guys haven't had a chance to check out Mark Olson's YouTube channel, successful contractor, you should do that. Anyway, Stain Man, welcome. Greetings from Texas. Please do a rain dance for us. Kenny, if I was going to do a rain dance for anybody, I would do a rain dance for Missouri first only because that's where I'm from. And then we would try to send some rain down your way. But it rained here. Uh, what day was that? I don't know. It was over the 4th of July weekend. I mean, it poured for probably three hours. And then about an hour later, so then it stopped. And there's some puddles here and there. Within an hour, dry desert. I mean, it, the grass was crunchy right again. Like, I feel like we just got a pretty substantial rain. And then the earth just like a dry sponge soaked it up and said, thank you. Can I have another? So I don't know. No rain dances for me, Kenny. Mine aren't working. Adam Sims. Hello. We've got a commercial client needing a standalone double gate installed over a 10 foot span on a concrete floor inside the warehouse chain link, six foot tall. Best way to secure the post of the floor. We like flanges. We, we like bolting it to the floor. Now, there's probably the other side of the aisle, the other camp in the, I don't know the analogy here, but there's some other guys. I see it a lot and it makes sense. They like to cord drill. Perfectly fine. If you have the equipment and if that's the process that works for you, both are fine. We prefer to weld plates on. Uh, so typically, depending on what do you say, uh, double gate over 10 foot span. So five foot gate, six foot tall, not going to be super heavy. Um, chain link. I'm assuming maybe 11 gauge, probably nine gauge, but still it's not going to be super heavy. I think six by six flange on probably a three inch post would suffice. Now you could also do an eight by eight flange on like a four inch post and be even beefier and sturdier. Uh, but we like flanges and that's how we operate. But I say that to say, I know there's guys that enjoy core drilling. And if that's you, Adam, break out the core drill and sink that thing straight into the floor. The thing about warehouse fence is it seems like it seems like their layouts change. I don't want to say frequently, but like annually, maybe. Maybe they get a new manager in or maybe they get a new supervisor in that wants, uh, you know, this pin larger or wants it over in the other corner or whatever. They like to change their minds. Well, if they're core drilled, you don't really have the option of moving that thing. So, but if they're plated, you can re you can remove the uh, redheads. You can place some non shrink grout in the holes that way it makes it really nice. Move that thing, resync it, totally fine. I mean, you'll obviously see the non shrink grout where the holes were, where the redhead tap cons went in. I understand those are two different brands, but we, anyway, you get the point where the bolts were. Um, but it's an easier process to move it. That's probably what we would, I, that's not probably what we, we would do. That is what we would do. Um, or, or as you're getting ready to see in this week's video at noon, um, sometimes they just want to put uh, construction panels in a warehouse. So, you know, there's always that option, but no, I would, I, I would plate it. So 
Uh, depending if there's specs, I mean, whatever the specs call out, three inch on a uh, on a six by six plate or a four inch on an eight by eight plate, I think would be plenty strong for that gate. But Vince fam out there watching, sure to let me know what you guys think in the description or in the description in the comments below, not the description. Michael Babbitt, hey Joe, North Michigan again. Hello, Michael. You guys are going through a heat wave as well. I I was. I was watching the memes on Facebook, which is where I get all my news. And uh, it sounds like you guys are going through a heat wave as well. Matt Warner, speak of speak of the giant. Let's start, let's make that a thing. Speak of the giant. Always strive to improve. I, I think that uh I think that is a hallmark to success here. Matt, I think that's what I'm figuring out is like I say, the guys that the guys you look up to and, and think they've got it figured out, you go and talk to them, they're like, ah. Oh, I don't have anything figured out. So I was having this conversation with the guy that, that I was talking to about starting some social content like this. And he's like, boy, you guys have it all figured out. And I was like, ugh, we're figuring it out. Like we are in the process. But in my perspective, like this thing's held together with duct tape and bubble gum, but we're getting there. Right. Uh, but it's, it's all kind of a matter of perspective. You know, like I said, the guy at the bottom of the mountain looks up and sees you, thinks you're at the top. Uh, and then once he goes up and chats with you, he realizes you're just on your way. You're still on your way to the summit. Matt, thank you so much for joining. Matt's involved with the uh, news that we'll start teasing out next month. Start, I guess, technically. So I think I started the teasing now, though, actually. So that was probably, yeah, anyway. Okay. Stay tuned for more teasing. Doozy Ben says, Joe, I'm planning a DIY three-foot fence for my front yard. Most of the advice on your channel seems to have six foot examples. It's the majority of what we do. Uh, would these tips still apply for a three foot? Absolutely. So uh, in terms of hold debt, well, let me scroll and see. Doozy said that we're in Washington. All right. So, you know, is frost depth is going to come into play no matter what the height of the fence. So I had this conversation with someone in one of the comments of one of the videos about, about the frost depth and, my opinion being you want to be six inches below frost depth is if possible. Their point was I'm building a four foot fence. A frost depth is six feet deep. I'm not putting a post six foot in the ground for a four foot fence or three foot fence. I get it. However, the way frost heave works is it doesn't matter how, how tall the fence is above the ground. If frost can get under the post and push it, it will. I mean, that's one of the reasons. So that's one of the reasons. I'm not a geologist, but my grandpa told me this is one of the reasons we get rocks that push up in our field. So we could go through and clear this field out with rocks. Like used to be, we'd have to throw them into piles. And as kids, that was, you know, we built character by doing that. Uh, now they've got machines that do it. And I think that's completely unfair. Those tow them behind tractors and like scoop up all the rocks. But anyway, but the rocks always come back because my, what I was told, not a geologist. Do not take this as professional geology advice. This is only ed for educational purposes. But frost heaves those rocks up, is my understanding. So does the same thing for fence posts. If that frost line can get under the post, it will push that post up. Now, gradually, it won't te technically or typically happen in year one, uh, but over time it can. Now, some guys will try to com com combat, combat this by belling out the bottom of the hole. So you'll have a straight shaft for the post hole and then they'll bell out the bottom so that it has a larger slug at the bottom than at the top so that the ground surrounding that pole holds that plug down i've seen it work that could absolutely happen but anyway three foot fence front yard most of the advice channel is six foot with these tips they'll apply they absolutely would hey, doozy let's do this once you ask a little bit more specific questions but if it's in regards to post hole depth it typically is you know, you want to see those posts typically with 30 inches or more. Aloha Fence, Howie Rolls says, what's up? Back from Idaho. What's up, Josh? Good morning. Happy belated birthday. I, actually, I told you happy birthday on your birthday, but on the channel, I'm saying happy belated birthday. Josh, he was doing a bunch of eight-foot-tall brown-coated wire, uh, and... <laughs> Someone up there didn't get their ducks in a row, and Josh got thrown smack dab in the middle of it and uh, caught a cease and desist on the project because somebody didn't get their permits correctly. 
what it sounds like. Not somebody being Josh, somebody being the GC. And I don't know the GC, so I don't want to throw shade at that. But anyway, welcome. I say welcome back. I mean, obviously, you're not in Missouri, but glad you're back safely, for sure. We're going to include, Josh, we're going to include that transaction. I, well, we have, actually haven't talked about it on the Week in the Life. But what I want to do, I want to talk about it because it's kind of like this crazy um, – kind of like national lampoons vacation like picture the map of the united states a guy in missouri gets a call from a guy in utah about a project in idaho but i don't have the wire but i know a guy over in wyoming that does now he's going to idaho anyway for a different project he says yeah i've got the eight foot brown i can put it on and i can have it to them just in the nick of time kind of this crazy little anyway josh welcome thank you so much jeremy's here as always hey from fort worth Hello, Jeremy. Corey says, when you build wooden, wooden metal frame drive through gates, what is your tubing size and thickness of choice? It seems to be more personal preference than an ASCM standard. Typically, it is. So, steel frame gates for wood fences, inch and a half by inch and a half square, 16 gauge, is what we've found really good success with. A lot of guys will use round. A lot of guys will use heavier. It is. It's more personal choice than like a like a firm standard, such as like an ASTM standard. Uh, for us, inch and a half square, 16 gauge works out really nicely. Most of the national wholesalers keep it in stock. I know this because we're having to order in a couple more bundles. We actually did that this week. Actually, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, I need to verify that that purchase order went out. But, yep, inch and a half square, 16 gauge galvanized tubing is where we're at on that. CS Vinyl says, uh, Mother Nature doesn't care how tall your fence is. That's the thing is, you know, I understand that. I understand the, the, uh, it wasn't an argument. It was just a discussion in the chat. But their point was, that, yeah, it's a three foot or four foot tall fence. Why am I setting these things six foot in the ground? You don't have to. Structurally speaking, that fence would be fine at 30 inches or so. But that frost evil absolutely push it up. It doesn't care. You know, to CNS's point, it doesn't care how tall the fence is. And also, the fence being shorter kind of does it a detriment because it's not as heavy of, of a fence. Now, that actually doesn't matter so much. As I'm thinking this through, that doesn't matter so much because frost, heave, frost can heave massive structures. I mean, it it doesn't care. So, whether a fence is six foot or three foot doesn't really matter either. But, anyway. Guys, I want to take a minute to talk to you about staying seal experts. Caleb and Ashley and the whole team. I shouldn't do names. I always say this. I shouldn't do names because then I got to talk about, you know, Michael and Cody and uh, and and Abby's over there doing content. And I got to talk about the whole. And I've already missed some people and I apologize. The Stain Steel Experts team, top notch. Like these folks a lot. Uh, there's a reason they're our stain of choice. They were our stain of choice before they came on the show, and actually they came on the show because they're our stain of choice. Uh, when we talk about, actually, so we were having this conversation yesterday. Uh, we're bringing on a another new sponsor in, in the near future. And uh, the conversation went something like, I only want to have conversations about sponsorship from companies that we enjoy working with. Because I don't want to introduce you, the viewer or the listener, to a brand that I don't believe in. Because then if you go to them and you have a bad experience, that doesn't put me in the best light with you, right? And it's just like, if we're talking about referrals to other contractors, it's the same thing. We only refer out to contractors that I know for a fact do incredible work so that when whoever's being referred goes to this company and has a great experience and loves working with this person, it makes me look better for being the one that connected those dots. Same thing with sponsorship is we're not going to entertain. We, we get sponsorship requests from some just off the wall. There's a lot of, uh, anyway, some off the wall and it's not even fencing related. Usually the ones that reach out randomly aren't fencing related at all. They just see a channel that has a following and they want to try to jump in on that kind of ride that wave up. Right. But the end typically just gets sent to spam and not answered at all, but because I don't know them, they, they it could be a great brand and it could be a great product. I don't know. The fact that I don't know them means that you guys probably wouldn't know them. And so it would probably be weird anyway. So that's sponsor talk on the channel. But 
getting back to San Seal Experts, they're a sponsor because I believe in them. I love using them. We actually restained our fence probably been a month ago now, a month and a half ago maybe. It's a stain I use on my fence. I've got a four-year-old. Yeah, he he's he's kind of out of his wall licking phase, but I've got a one and a half year old that's kind of coming into wall licking phase. Anyway, I'm not going to use a stain that I don't feel comfortable with them just like putting her hand on, licking the hand because or eating us. You get the point, right? And my neighbors have pets. I'm not going to use a stain that I don't feel is really safe for them to interact with that my family can be around and all that. We have used. Um, other stains in the past from national brands that you have likely heard of. And the initial, we didn't actually get into staining because this was in my fact finding phase. Uh, we brought in kind of a couple uh, jugs or a couple pails of each just to try out and opening the, opening the can, you get hit with the chemical smell right off the bat. And my first intuition is, I mean, I could dive into this and I could figure out that, chemicals are not as dangerous as they smell or as they seem but the thing is i don't get that opportunity to say that to the neighbor behind the client that we're doing work for i can explain that to my client but when the chemical smell kind of wafts through the neighborhood there's going to be some questions or at least some thoughts about the product we're using or the process we're using anyway that was uh, what stopped us in our tracks from offering staining in the in the past but stainless steel experts pop the top. You don't get the chemical smell. You feel better about it from day one. And the team over there stopped not. So anyway, I enjoy working with them. Thank you so much, Stainless Steel Experts, for one, treating my business and our clients so well, but also for sponsoring the show. I really, really do appreciate it. For more information on Stainless Steel Experts, check the description below. All right, let's catch up. Hey, we know this guy, Jason from Tail End Fencing. He was here Oh, a few months ago, we're getting ready to have a, a the third winner in. Technically, at the end of this month, it's actually going to be the following week, the beginning of August. So a little bit of a, we had a conflict in schedules, but we're getting it resolved. Jason was here a few months ago from Tail and Fence in Colorado. Jason, welcome. So glad you're here. Divine Fence is here, as always. Thank you so much, Divine Fence. Hello, Joe and Fence fam. What's your preferred post hole diggers at Ozark Fence? Mark and Dan, new video on the new hammering diggers was very different. I agree. Um, it's kind of interesting. So we pretty much always use the Bobcat MT100. Um, we don't take on small... Right now, we're fortunate enough to where we're only taking on full-size projects that we know we can get equipment on pretty easily. Um, now, things slow down. We can absolutely reevaluate that thought, but that's kind of where we're at. The Bobcat MT100 does probably 95% of the digging. Uh, other than that, we've got some just good old-fashioned steel clamshell diggers. Uh, they're solid steel. I understand there's a conversation about electrical lines, but my stance is we don't dig within two foot of an electrical line anyway. It's a non-starter. Uh, we've gotten in these conversations in the Facebook groups about, you know, someone, you know, showing that red line running right down the property line. They're like, well, we're going to have to dig carefully. No, not at all. If it's red, it's high voltage. They only mark high voltage. They won't mark low voltage just because low voltage isn't tip typically a public utility anyway. If it's red, we're not going anywhere near it. Nah, not, this isn't negotiable. Now, on other utilities, if it's a you know a cable line or if it's water, gas is a non-starter just like water. Um, if it's one of the other ones, we'll dig carefully. We'll try to do some excavation or some exploratory holes just to try to figure out where they are, where they're going, and we can figure that out. That's negotiable. As long as we get a, a, a release, signed release from the client saying that we'll be held harmless if we do hit one. Now, we do go out of our way not to hit them just because it kind of ruins our day just like everybody else's day. We've got to stop and call it in and everything else. But if you sign, if you're the client and you sign a release, we'll do it. We'll, we'll try to put this fence up. We're obviously in the business of building fences. But if it's gas or electric, no release in the world is going to get us to dig within two foot of that line. Because it's incredibly dangerous. Now, 
I understand the argument behind gas is it's not really dangerous. As soon as the gas hits the atmosphere, like these thoughts of this thing blowing up are kind of, they're just not, they're, they're a little overinflated, right? The problem about hitting gas is when you hit gas, I mean, obviously when you hit any utility, you have to call it in as a strike. But when you hit gas, they send all of the emergency responders. I mean, you get the police, you get the fire, you get EMS and the gas professionals. It shuts your job site down for the day. I mean, you might as well just tell the guys, hey, ex- stick around to explain it to the professional that's going to repair it. But as soon as they're on site and they understand what it is, you might as well come back to the shop because you're not getting anything done the rest of the day. They're going to, it turns into a bit of a circus. For public safety reasons, I totally understand. But anyway, gas and electric, not going to get us started. So therefore, I feel fine using steel clamshell diggers because we're not, we're not going to come within two foot of a high voltage line. It's not even going to be possible. 99% not going to be possible. I say that because we've all been on yards where you find utilities that weren't marked for one reason or another. So I guess there's always, never say never, I guess, right? But anyway, really long answer to talk about our preferred hole diggers are the Bobcat MT100s, uh, and we clean them out with all steel clamshell, just kind of your standard diggers. Hope that helps. Corey Cortez says, hi, Joe, I'm from Chicago. Welcome. Building a horizontal fence with Postmaster Post, you're already off to a great start. Had to remove about 50, 50 trees. That's a lot of trees. You have done some timber clearing at this point. Medium to large. Moving on to grinding phase. Any tips? Enjoy your style of presentation. Um, moving on to the grind. So, like, grinding the tree stumps, maybe? Is that what we're discussing? Um, typically, we've got a contractor that we hire out to do all of the removal. Uh, just because he'll bring in. We can go rent equipment and then try to figure it out. He's going to bring equipment with him. And his guys do this all day, every day. So they'll do it at least twice as fast as we will. Um, so typically we'll include that in the bid and we'll include it as a separate line item. So, Hey, you've got these 50 trees that are medium to large. They're outside of our scope of work. I do have a contractor that we enjoy working with. They are very good at what they do. Here would be their cost to remove and dispose of whatever this is. And then leave us with a nice clean pallet. Start building your fence down. Um, but like I said, it, horizontal fence, postmaster post. You're off to a rock and start. Uh, I understand there's other brands out there that do purpose-built steel posts, the Lifetime, the Gregory, et cetera, and onward. Postmaster is our post of choice. It's the original. I We enjoy using them. This was part of a conversation yesterday, too, that they are getting a little pricey, and they've got some import competition. But we still go with them because they're they're the original. They've got the research behind them. They've got the warranty that they stand behind. It's our post of choice. So I think you're off to a great start. Let me know more about the grinding. Um, I don't have tips on stump grinding. That's I'm trying to think. I think I've ground two stumps in my lifetime. One was at my parents' house. And then uh, one was on a friend of mine that we were building fence on. And this was a particular job that I learned that I am not a tree removal or you know, stump grinding expert and that we should hire expert help moving forward. Uh, took forever. I mean, and I went and rented the uh, really good equipment. The uh, It's kind of automated really at this point, the equipment that we brought in, but it still took forever. And it, the customer was happy. It was a buddy of mine. He was totally fine with it. But in my heart, I didn't love it. Um, so anyway. Thank you for tuning in. Let me know if you have any questions about building the fence. The fence questions I've got, I can answer fence questions. Tree removal, stump grinding, not quite my ball of wax. Divine fence, topic of conversation. How do you keep track of your crew's progress day to day? So this is an interesting topic because this is kind of a, it's kind of a thought that's on our mind right now is can we, right now we're, we're, they're basically self-reporting progress. Um, so the thought is, and the guys we have right now and gals we have right now, I trust explicitly. They're here because I really trust them to do the job that they're here to do. And so when they self-report, I take it at face value. And I would. If our team stays this size into eternity, I will always trust their self-reporting. 
But as teams grow, we bring on people that may not be of that mind. Now, there's also the argument on are you hiring people you don't trust? Mm, no, but anyway, okay. So there's also the saying trust but verify, right? So that's kind of the thought that's going around right now is – is there a better way, a more accurate way to track progress rather than self-reporting? Um, I don't know. So there's not really, like you can track the landmarks, the milestones, the benchmarks, whatever. You can track, you know, on-site. You can track late, you know, project laid out, all holes dug, all holes set. You could track like big milestones, but I feel like you'd still be self you'd be relying on self-reporting on that rather than so the typical way of dealing with this and, and probably the way that we'll deal with this moving forward would be hire like a field supervisor. We technically have one in Scott, and he also leads a crew, so that's a little here and there, but would be to hire a full-time field supervisor who their job is to oversee all jobs day to day check in through the day to verify the self-reported progress. Um, but what we're trying to th think about and figure out is, is there a way uh, to get away from self-reporting the milestones? Because sometimes the milestones aren't reported correctly, just out of error, right? Not out of maliciousness. Not out, There's no malicious intent here. It's just a little bit of, I think we're 50% through the set because we've got all the holes dug, and we're starting to set. So I think we're about halfway through the set. But in terms of man man hours, you're more than halfway through, right? We've got more time digging, typically more time digging these holes than we have setting the holes. Just because in our land of rocks and hard play and all the rest of it, it's kind of hard to dig. So you got more time invested in digging than you do in setting. So if you report, if they self-report half done with the set, just because they're done digging the holes, well, they're actually probably 60% through the set, maybe 70% through the set. So anyway, how do we keep track of our crew's progress day-to-day self-reporting? I am absolutely interested to hear how you guys track in the field crew progress day-to-day, -day. Um, you know, internally. So when we're talking about like e-commerce, that's a lot easier to track progress, right? Because those are some easily verified milestones. All the fittings are pulled, all the fittings are wrapped, all the fittings are heat shrinked, all the fittings are polybagged, all the boxes are made. We can track these pretty easily. You can at a glance see, I've got four boxes, I need four boxes, check goes to tick mark. So we use Asana. We've been using Asana uh, as a, what do you, do you know what you call Asana technically? Like a project tracking software maybe? I don't know. That's what I'm going to call it. Uh, we tried Monday.com. Uh, with mixed re mixed results, we're working with Asana now. Everyone seems to like it a lot better uh, on the fulfillment side. It's basically like, like I said, a project tracking software um, where they can just check off milestones. And it also kind of gives them a checklist of things to do. So I'll say, I'll say, we need to send out 300 sets of three-inch post hinges, what we used to call male hinges. Um so, and then it's pull, if we're sending out 300, pull 600 hinges, pull 600 carriage bolts, combine, wrap, heat shrink, poly bag, put it in a box or put labels on it, put it in a box, box the label, send it to Amazon. Each one of those are a milestone that's checked off as they're doing it. Uh, as the team grows, the neat, interesting thing with Asana is, and so David Gatto and I were talking about this. He's the one that, that started me down this path and that, I'd love to pick his brain more about the, anyway, you can, you can make other people's tasks dependent on the first task. So, so say we got to a point where in the fulfillment that we had a full-time box maker, like we needed so many boxes in a day that we have one person, their goal is just making boxes, keeping the fulfillment guys ready for boxes, take a little bit to make. So, and they got to stop what they're doing and then go make a box and, that's the next thing I think we're going to do. But so every time a new task is made, they would get a task that says build 18, 15 by 12 by 10 boxes. Or I think actually they're 15, 13, 10 boxes. So they would, all they see on their task list is their list, list of boxes. They'd make the boxes, pick it off, 
send them down the line to whoever needed them. Anyway, a little bit easier to track in-house because they're just easily verified. So anyway, I would love to, I'd love to hear about how you guys track crew progress day to day out in the field. I hope there was an answer in there for you somewhere. I really do. CNS says we use the metal diggers as well. You can purchase heat shrink that will fill fit the handles as well. Absolutely. So, yeah, so what we're talking about is basically the hand holds at the top of it. Those are the first thing to get worn out because you're gripping it and then you're driving it into the ground to clean out holes or if you're digging to try to... These, these hand holds, these rubber hand holds, they go pretty quickly. They just... They are taking the brunt of this force. You chew through them pretty quickly. But, yeah, you can get... You can, get, you can get replacements for them pretty easily. Vine Fitz is absolutely right. Smash the like button. And actually, there's an update to this thought. So Facebook is kind of caught on to, and I'm is kind of caught on to the fact that liking is easy. You can just scroll and like, 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 like really easily. So they're actually not weighing that. I don't know that they're not weighing it at all, but they're not weighing it nearly as heavy as other alternate actions. So if you hold the like button, then you go up to all the, I don't know what you'd call them, emotional feedback. Nah, that's probably not what you call it. But it's like reactions. That's a, That would be the better way. Yeah, that. Thank you, Braden, for that. But it's not the like. It's the love. It's the care. It's the laugh. It's the cry. It's angry face, whatever. Um, those are the ones now that the algorithm is giving more weight to. So. If you take a second more, instead of liking it to choose one of the other reactions, that would be even better. But Divine Fence, thank you for reminding me to remind everyone to do that. And if you're listening to us on a podcast, the preferred reaction on podcasts is a review, an honest review. In reading the terms of service, I'm not allowed to ask for a particular star rating of review. That's clearly wrong. But if you were to leave an honest review of your experience of the podcast, that would be fantastic. Corey Bigelow, what is up? Says, do you have your crews working overtime? Yes. Some people are against overtime, but with the labor market being what it is and the demand, we do include five to 10 hours in our bidding process. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, when warranted, right? Like, let's not, we're not doing overtime sweeping floors, but. We will do overtime if the project at hand calls for it. Because let's think about it. So, one, you're right, the labor shortage. But labor, the labor market's getting better as far as uh, just field help, right? So we're able to – we're actually adding two more team members on uh, to help with kind of general team member stuff. So helping in the yard or helping in the shop or helping with e-commerce, just kind of all-around helpers, really. And we had – a lot of good feedback to that. So I'm the labor shortage may not be as much of a thing uh, moving forward, but he, but so you hire somebody now, instead of 10 hours overtime, now you need to find 40 hours of work. If, if you're going to keep them fully employed, 40 hours of work, plus all the extras, all the onboarding, the shirts, the hats, the, this, the, that, there's a lot that goes into it. So I would rather pay overtime to the people that are already on staff that we already know, like, and trust. They already have shirts. They already have hats. They already have training to get the job done rather than try to bring a whole new team member in. If really, honestly, all we're looking at is five to 10 hours a week overtime, I think we're money ahead by having the team members that we already know, like, and trust just to perform that overtime rather than bring in a whole new employee. It also rewards the employees that have been with you through the shortages, right? That have helped you get through the tough times. Let's reward them by giving them some overtime. And as you indicated, you're including it in your bidding process anyway. So it's a win-win. You get paid for. You're not out additional funds. The guys are rewarded and gals are rewarded uh, by sticking with you, by getting this overtime rather than bringing on new staff to try to help pull the load. Anyway, you have your crews working overtime. Yes. Yeah, typically, and, and you're right, five to 10 hours a week is in the ballpark of where we're at. Depends on the week, depends on the project. Um, what was it two weeks ago? We actually had one crew work a Saturday. Um, the heat had kind of got to them, uh, and we had some weather. They just got behind, and so they actually came 
came to us, came to the the leadership team and said, you know, we'd like to work tomorrow, Saturday. We the the crew chief came and said, I've got the guys for it. I've got the plan. It was it was running two by fours and pickets on a on a project that had already been set. He's like, this is an easy peasy one day in and out. Can we go do that? Absolutely. So some weeks it's a little bit more. Most weeks you're in the right ballpark of five to ten hours. Vine Finn says company cam helps us tremendously. And I was given that nugget from Dan at Nashville. Absolutely. Yeah, company cam. I like company cam a lot. So for from visual kind of progress, I so this is talking about how do you uh how do you keep up with the day-to-day -day progress reports, right? The self-reported or otherwise. So company cam makes sense. So instead of them self-reporting to say we're halfway through, send me a picture of what you, of where you're at right now. And so in this example where all the holes are dug and they're already three posts in on setting, you could look at that and know, well, they're more than halfway through. So they're probably 60% setting, depending on what the fence is, 60, 70% done. Um, I like company. So company cam, we love using it from a marketing perspective because it is super easy to get pictures off of that platform. Now we use a different CRM that will likely be changing soon. Uh, that also offers pictures to be uploaded on their platform, but it's kind of clunky to get them off. You have to go to each project. You have to download all the pictures, then get out of that project into the new project, download all those. It's kind of a clunky process, honestly. With company cam, you can download all the pictures from a given week and pretty easily. You can also tag pictures. So say we're looking for pictures of six foot shadow box fence installed with cedar pickets on steel post. Just tick the chat, the tick the tag filters, and then you're you're left with all the pictures that have those particular tags: six foot shadow box, cedar picket, steel post. Click select all and download them. Now you have a complete portfolio of all the projects that are six foot shadow box with cedar pickets on steel post. Come to Cam, massive, like them a lot. They also make it really easy to do before and after pictures, so it will ghost image. So you take your before. And then when you go to take an after picture, so the before is before the fence is there. The after is once it's all done. People love, clients love before and after. They are great for marketing. Company Cam will ghost your before image on your phone or tablet or whatever you use to take pictures. So you can see to line up the after. You can get the after as close as humanly possible to the before, snap the picture, so that when it does like the diagonal, like before and after, it lines up like super close, really close. I, that's a feature that I probably use the most. It also, it also give you, it'll tell you if you're, if it's level or if it's, if it's level left to right, or if it's tilted front to back, it'll kind of give you that just on your display. So you can get the angles correct. And it's pretty good. You can also do video on company cam now. So I was doing a project walkthrough yesterday. I took all the before, so I put out all the flags of the layout of the fence because it's it's a massive property. We're doing a small, not not a small, we're doing a 300-foot aluminum job, but it's small in regards to the entire property. So I went out and flagged it. That way everyone is super clear. Here's the corners. Here are the gates, that sort of thing. Snap pictures with company cam of the flags because, not necessarily on this, this job's kind of out in the country, but we snap pictures of all the flags because when I was a kid, I love going and grabbing those flags and doing kid stuff with the flags. So they've been known to walk away, take pictures of the flags. But also now what we'll do is we'll do a video walkthrough on this one. It had a septic leach field that had a line going kind of through the job. So video, uh, you know, in this particular, Scott was a crew chief on this particular project. It starts uh, Tuesday. Anyway, hey, Scott, here's a project out at such and such address in such and such town. Here's the layout. I uh, chart here at the corner, out 12 foot, down six foot. Then you got a four foot gate, full sections onto the corner, on around. But in a video, here is the sep here is the leech line for this septic. You need to make sure that we have a panel that spans this. So if it requires a short panel somewhere else, that's totally fine. We need a full panel centered over this line so we know that we're nowhere near it and if they ever need to come maintain it, they can just take off the panel, do whatever they need to do, and then put the panel back. Uh, 
company cam lets us do that via video. So then when Scott gets there, he can pull up the video, view it, view all the pictures, and he's going to be ready to go. It also lets you notate. Uh, so on this particular project, uh, I fully understand I should always have a tape measure with me at all times, but sometimes my tape measure goes into little hand little hands come and get my tape measures out of my trucks and they don't put it back i should check it i didn't check it yesterday we had to measure we're doing some short panels underneath underneath the porch right so one of the corners that we're going to the house is actually a porch we're going to do two short panels under the porch so i was measuring so that we can fabricate them ahead of time uh so on it so i took a picture of the porch and i notated from here to here is four iphones tall so I just measure four iPhones. Now I need to go measure my iPhone, figure out how many. Anyway, you can notate this is how tall it is. This is where the line is. Anyway, company cam is massive. Like them a lot. His final says, we rely on field supervisors to keep track as well as man hours spent versus footage for the week. So that's a good point, too, is one thing we rely on self-reporting is hours on the job. So now there are some guys that have time tracking software that where they can clock onto and off of jobs. Definitely interesting. We do self-reporting. They'll self-report it in the project manager. So they'll say it used this many pickets, this many rails, this many posts. Set was this many hours. Finish was this many hours. So that we can kind of we can kind of figure out what their production rate was on that fence. But a lot of it is self-reported. Um, but keeping track of Foot, uh, footage versus actuals is a real thing too so we like to kind of circle back around after the week's done so on monday we'll look at so this coming monday i'm gonna look at the projects that were done this week what did we bid as far as materials how many pickets rails post were bid how many did we actually use how many man hours were bid how many were actually used to get an idea make sure that we're still in the ballpark and understand if we got off why did we get off and next time, can we see that coming? You know, next time when we're, you know, whatever the issue is, next time we see that thing, we'll know, oh, that added two hours to the job last time I saw this. So I need to add X many man hours. You know, for us, three guys on jobs, so if that's two hours, I need to add six man hours to this job to account for this thing that I think might take some extra time. Uh, but yeah, great point as far as bid versus act. So you call it hour spent versus footage for the week. So, but you also need to track your bid versus actual, I think just to keep a thumb on the pulse of what's going on. Uh, Nathan Downs using photos to track is a great idea. How often do some of you have your teams taking pics? Uh, I would love feedback on this because I think we probably don't do it enough. Uh, so we'll do. They'll typically do jobs when they get on the job or do pictures when they get on the job and then when they get off the job. They'll take pictures of where the truck is because sometimes we'll get – now, the truck's always on the road. It's always got a trailer, but it's always on the curb, right, on the shoulder. Sometimes we'll get blamed for oil leaks further down the road. They'll say, well, your truck leaked oil. Well, I know my trucks, they don't leak oil. Definitely wasn't our truck. And it's like, no, 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 it definitely was. So we take pictures of our truck, exactly where it's located, so that we, then we can see and say, you know, Mr. and Ms. Customer, I absolutely understand that you believe it was us. However, here's a picture of where our truck was parked. You're talking about further down your drive or further down your curb or whatever, your road frontage. It wasn't us, unfortunately. Um, so where the truck's parked, uh, any notable anything. So uh utility flags utility markings that are close to the layout flags they'll get pictures uh dan blanc actually has his guys do uh from what i remember hearing him say uh they do like a midday update too to where so midday they'll take a whole new set of pictures on exactly where they're at uh, they'll send them to dan then dan usually or, or dylan probably updates the clients on hey here's just a midday update on exactly how your project's going i like that a lot I uh, like to hear from you guys. What do you, what what do you guys do as far as photos go? It's so easy now with the technology. I'm sure there's others out there besides Company Cam. That's just the one that I think works really easily. Um, with, as easy as it, is, as it is to take and send the pictures, it's a no brainer. I I'm a, I'm willing to learn. 
I think that we could always improve our process. So I'm here to, I'm here to hear how you guys handle your pictures. What is up, fellow Joe from Southeast Texas? Oh, fence is put on hold. Neighbor disputes property pin placement. Super common. Got to have a survey done, so so he'll shut up. Uh, 800 bucks for that. Screaming deal. If it's a full survey, $800 is a screaming deal on that. So typically, typically we're around $600 just to have the, just to have the pins located. Not the survey report, not the overview, not the, you know, the whole kit and caboodle. That's something closer to $2,500. Um, now, on yours, you might be talking about just having the pins located. And still, for this discussion, that's absolutely acceptable to have a surveyor come in with their professional equipment and show exactly where those property pins are. Three things keep a fence company in business. Kids, pets, and neighbors. The neighbors are usually the one that you got to deal with in sticky situations. But uh, let me think. We had, well, I was going to say we did. We kind of had each one of the, we checked each one of those boxes this week. We had one project that was kids and neighbors because it was neighbor kids that were not well behaved at all. So fence is going up to uh, more clearly define whose yard is whose. Uh, and then the big, Aluminum project outside of town is uh, for pets. Keep pets in the backyard. So, yeah, I'm telling you, kids, pets, and neighbors, top three. Should say survey redone. Last one was 25 years ago. So, yeah, so they're probably remarking the pins. Totally fine. CNS says, uh, Nathan, we have a private, private group on Facebook that our guys constantly take pictures and videos of everything from finished work to weird stuff pulled out of the ground. I like that. Easy to access. Technically, it's cloud storage, right? So they're storing the pictures and videos, so you're not paying for storage. But, and you can easily invite new team members into the group. I like this private Facebook group. I like that a lot. It's also easy to download the pictures for marketing purposes. Good morning, Joe and Fence fam. Kevin, good morning to you. Hope everything is doing super well up in the Pacific Northwest. We actually uh, one of the client one of the clients we did work for this week um, came from Pacific Northwest. I thought endearingly of you and yours uh, when I was talking to him. It was kind of kind of north of where you guys are, but anyway. Divine Fence says uh, we have our project manager flag and mark the layout, take pics and videos, and then each foreman before midday and after pics and videos. Okay, so here's another vote for midday pictures. Um, I like it. I like it. We might be revamping our process. So project management is kind of one of the things I'm pitching in and helping Sarah out with right now, just because she's Sarah handled it for three years, the whole process, sales, project management, the whole kit and caboodle. Um, but we're getting to the point now where she is beyond capacity and she was trying, she was, she was putting in a lot of hours to try to keep up try to get it done and all that. So uh, we're likely going to end up hiring a project manager, but I'm going to pitch in. So really what we're doing is I'm going to pitch in to try to create the process, right? When, do, when does the sales packet transfer the project manager? What role does the project manager play? How often, how do they interact between the client and the salesperson? What is that like? I like to get involved in that process and then figure out the standard procedure so that when we hire it, we know exactly what the expectations are. Anyway, that's kind of the role I'm filling right now. So I'll go out, like to your point, flag it, flag and mark the layout, take pictures, video with company cam. Uh, I like, so we're forming to do before and after pictures, but I like, I, I'm liking this midday update sort of thing. Uh, this is like the second or third time I've heard it talked about. So I believe this will come up in a future leadership meeting. Cannon Johnson, good morning, Joe. Cannon, good morning. Cannon, of course, of the Dan and Cannon My Fence Live show, Wednesdays on Facebook. You should check it out. Very good content. Um, yeah, Cannon was on a call with me yesterday involving the teasing of information that will start next month. Technically, I guess the teasing of the information has started. I'm teasing 
the teasing of the information. That's what we're doing because I'm not giving you any info about what it is or who's in. Well, I guess I am telling you about who's involved, but no more. No more information until next month. But Cannon is involved in it. And I'm, I like the team we're putting together here. Thanks to Dan Blanc. Okay, so we're kind of getting this midday from, from the same source. Yeah, Dan is where I'd heard it from about the midday pick update. I liked it a lot. And then they, in turn, push it on to their clients. Joe says, full survey because it makes sense. Screaming deal. 800 bucks on that is a smoking deal. Good job. Corey says, if you pull off a job because of a dispute, do you charge a mobilization fee? We haven't, but I could see if it, if we haven't, because it might happen once or twice a year, right? It rarely happens. Um, we try to, we try to sniff this out beforehand, right? It, first question, why are we putting up a fence? Not something people enjoy doing, something that you need doing. What's the fence for? What are we doing? And if it's, we start sniffing out it because the neighbor's kids keep throwing stuff in my yard. They leave their balls in my yard, this and that. Let's check out the pins. Let's check out the property pins just so I know that you know and that your neighbor knows that both of us know exactly where these pins are. What do you think? Pins missing. Let's have the surveyor out, repin the property. It's not a full blown survey, but it's, good enough for me to work with if the surveyor says the pins here the pins there we're done and we move on um that being said josh so we were talking to josh rand earlier in the show uh i don't i don't want to try to jump on his project but he was talking about um so they had an issue where they they had to pull off a job because it sounds like the gc didn't pull the correct permits or didn't pull a fence permit at all maybe uh, so they got cease and desist, and they had to uh, they had to pull out the job. And now he had mentioned in the live video that they will be charging a demobilization fee, which I think is warranted, right? It, it's going to require an, an additional trip, at minimum one additional trip, because they had to stop work for issues that were outside of their control. Uh, if it happened somewhat, and I don't even know frequently, if it happened more than a few times a year, that's probably something we would put in a contract that, you know, a demobilization for, you know, unforeseen for, you know, whatever the wording is, uh, will result in a fee of X. It would just be put in the contract and we would rarely use it. But when we do, maybe it covers that fee. I don't know. We do not, but it's something that you should probably, it's something that we're talking about. Absolutely. Project Metal Music, what is up from across the pond? Hey, Joe and everyone. Hello, Project Metal Music. Project Metal Music comes from us typically. I don't know where they are today, but typically they come to us from the UK. Appreciate you tuning in. For you, it's this afternoon. For us, uh, we're still in morning time. We are an hour away from the preview of today's Week in Life. Keep that in mind. We're also still going to talk about the contest that we're running that you can find in the link in the description below if you really want to, but I'm going to explain it more here in just a little bit. Michael Taylor, a.k.a. Bam Bam, says, we have the Facebook group also. I like it. I like it. I like it. So, all right. So, things we're going to think about, look into. I'm actually going to write these down. Why don't you write them down with me together? All right. Why don't you write them down with me together? That doesn't really make sense. We'll write these down together. That's what my brain should have said. Well, what, you know, okay. Um, mid, day, pick sure update like how i pronounce it every syllable in that um private facebook group that makes sense because they make it really easy to facebook makes it really easy to upload pictures and videos into private groups um you can have moderators you can have yeah you can share pictures from the Depending on settings, you could share pictures from the group. Uh, you could tag others in it. I like it. Roger Bincourt, Joe, let's talk equipment. This could be my favorite conversation. Uh, specifically, preferred nail gun. Eh, maybe not my first. Okay. 
and minimum compressor requirements. You almost had me when we, I got really excited about equipment. Um, no. So uh, preferred nail gun is the Metabo. So uh, the use, oh man. Now, see, you guys are going to get me in trouble here because I'm going to start talking. I'm, I'm familiar because I see the receipts that come through. Uh, typically, Scott, our crew chief on the wood crew, schools me on this. But Metabo is the brand. It was prior to Metabo something else. That problem. Okay. Metabo. Uh, minimum compressor requirements unknown. Uh, we should probably have Scott involved in this conversation. Um, I'll let him run with his own process. So, and, and it might vary by nail gun, I guess. Um, a lot of it's also, ah, oh, there we go. See, Canon is on this. It was Hitachi. There, Canon, thank you so much. I knew, I knew it was something before, but uh, yeah. Nail gun needs about 70 PSI. Canon, thank you so much. Uh, it might vary nail gun to nail gun, I suppose. It also varies kind of material to material. So I know I know we adjust it. I say we. I know Scott and his team adjust it, whether they're shooting uh, uh, pressure-treated pine or cedar. Uh, cedar takes a little bit less pressure. What we were finding is we were blasting through pickets. We had a job. Now, as a percentage, it had like three or four nails out of a 1,000 or so nails that had actually blown through the picket into the two by four and the tip of this nail was sticking out the other side. Like actually it probably wasn't sticking out, but you could see the wood was splintered and a little blown out. All right. Okay. Our fault. Right. So that's where we kind of came together and realized we need to have different settings for cedar as we do for pressure heated pine. Um, 70 PSI on the Metabo gun. So, no. So maybe we bring Scott on and talk a little bit about equipment. Maybe that's uh, maybe that's a thing we need to do. Maybe that's a segment we need to do. Uh, but Cannon's absolutely right. Metabo, great guns. So we like. They don't need a lot of. I'm trying to think. Of, they don't need a lot of repairs. So typically, what we see is the striker, what we call it, the finger that hits the nails that jams that thing into the wood that gets stuck. Sometimes we oil and lubricate every morning, but sometimes that still gets bound up, uh, which not a big thing. We typically carry two extra on a truck so that we can put a rubber band on that one so that they know it's not to be used until it gets repaired, put in the tool bin and then grab the next one and go. Not often though. And it's not hard. It's not a hard fix. We used to work on them ourselves until the guy that delivers the nails, the company that does the nails, told us, they're like, I don't know why, because we had ordered some parts through them. We said, we need, you know, two strikers. We need this and that and the other. Uh, and he's like, why? He goes, you know, we fix these for free, right? He said, as long as it's not crazy, we'll fix it for free because you buy the nails and screws from us. Uh, he goes, I'll just take it back to the shop. They'll fix it. As long as it's less than $200 to fix it, we don't even charge you for it. Now, they just go on a shelf, and the nail guy, the nail guy shows up once a week. Check inventory levels on nails and screws. Pick up whatever guns are broken. Drop off whatever ones are fixed. Metabo is a great brand. We like them a lot. Okay. Ken's looking at a new work truck. Ken, what are you looking at? We, we're we talking. So we have the Isuzu NPR now, and I'm almost, almost to the point of saying that's what our future trucks will be, those Isuzu NPRs. Um, I like them a lot. Right now, we've got Ram 3500s and cabin chassis with flatbeds, uh, diesel. Uh, great platform, but they don't... Here's the thing about work trucks is they don't get driven a lot, right? So, they'll typically drive from our from our office to a job site, sit all day long, get loaded back up, driven back to the office, and they'll sit all night long. They'll drive two times a day. If, it's, uh, if we've got short projects, maybe they drive three times a day, but... We're starting to find out maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe the diesel platform isn't what we need. Great for torque, great for longevity. I mean, we only need to do, I think we average three oil changes a year or something on these things. So not bad. But you do, and then you got the fuel filters as well. Oil changes on these things are about $250, $300. So anyway, 
This is the NPR, though. Nice little platform. It's got a 20-some-odd-foot bed to where we don't have to pull a trailer with it. Kind of nice. You know, four less tires. You got one less tag. You got – it's got some benefits to it. Interested what you guys are looking at for – oh, actually, you entered it here in just a minute. So, options are diesel or gas, Chevy 3500, pros and cons, your preference. Uh, all right. So, not a Chevy guy. I, here, yeah, this is all personal preference, right? Ford, Chevy, Ram, whatever. I like Rams. Um, let me think. Besides the Isuzu, everything else is Ram. Uh, we used to have a Ford Transit van that we used for staining and sealing. Um, we had sold that. <laughs> we sold it for more than we paid for it like three years and 40,000 miles ago, which is mind boggling. But anyway, um, everything besides that is Suzu is Ram. So I can't speak on the Ford Chevy Ram thing. I've always driven Rams or Dodges before they split into Ram for work trucks. Um, that's just kind of where I'm at. 3,500 is a good platform. Kind of no matter. It's a one ton platform. Right, so it's a heavy-duty work truck. Well, it, and they've got, all right, so they've got 45, 55, 65, whatever. It's a good platform. The one-ton platform is good for what we do for residential and for a fair amount of the commercial work that we do. Absolutely understand there's a lot of guys, a lot of commercial guys that drive the bigger rigs. I mean, Sean's a good example, right? Um, drive the bigger, big Ford whatever 650s 750s or guys there's a few fence guys i've seen in some of the groups that drive the kodiaks or the, re the really big trucks um because they do a bunch of big commercial stuff and they haul big equipment totally understandable not really our bag here man i'm telling you i'm thinking a suzu npr could really be the way i want i'm waiting to see I, i'm waiting to see if they're like the shoe's going to drop on this thing and it needs some more work or anything like that it's we bought it used. We didn't buy it in new condition. Uh, and it's been, I mean, knock on wood, it has been a great truck for us. It might be the it might be the future work trucks for us. Those are Suzy NPRs. This one's a single cab. A lot of the landscapers in our area are using these now, and they'll use the quad cab. So the Ram 3500s we use, they're all quad cab or, listen, I don't know, crew cab. What? They got four doors. They will hold five men, people comfortably whatever you want to call it quad cab crew cab i don't know but anyway they have that version of the isuzu so the longer crew orders and then they've got still the 20 plus foot some of these landscapers have really massive beds on them um i that's probably where we're going gas versus diesel i'm almost to the point of leaning towards gas uh, especially as we're having a conversation now in the economy about deaf fluid uh, maybe becoming harder to get a hold of. Uh, most modern, all modern diesel engines have to have the def fluid, the diesel exhaust fluid to maintain the emissions equipment. Um, so gasoline doesn't have that, but it does have a uh, does have a more in depth maintenance structure, right? So diesel is pretty straightforward. Like I said, three oil changes a year. When we change the oil, we change the water filter or the fuel filter, the water separator. Technically, those could go a little bit longer, but then we're scheduling a separate down day for this truck to get in. We just, when we do an oil change, we do the water or the fuel filter and the water separator all in one shot. It's like 250, 300 bucks. More expensive than an oil change for sure on gas, but I don't know. That's just, I don't know, is kind of the answer, right? Diesel is a great platform for grunt work, like just for heavy stuff that needs to go a ways or, Great torque, great longevity. If you need a truck that's going to go two, three, four hundred thousand miles or something, diesel is a great platform. Our work trucks don't rack up that many miles though, so kind the the thought is maybe we go towards gas. I don't know. I'm I'm willing to hear thoughts on this. I absolutely am. Um, but. Gas Isuzu NPRs is kind of, and Isuzu is one brand that makes these type of things. It's just the one that we have experience with. I think Chevy actually makes a version. I don't know what they call it, but I've seen Chevys that make a version of this NPR concept. Um, I don't know. 
maybe worth looking into. What do you got? What do you guys like driving for work trucks? Let's start there. Uh, Divine says with you on the Isuzu NPR trucks, awesome fence trucks. Some that don't like them is just because of the comfort. They are not built for comfort. They, you will not take one of these things on a road trip, but that's not what they're made for. Visibility is great. You're sitting over the front axle, massive front windshield, massive side windows. You can get a super great view all around this truck. I've driven it a few times when we were getting it wrapped. Well, when we bought it, then when we got it wrapped, I legitimately enjoyed driving it. Um, not having many blind spots. Room on the room on the bed is massive, 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 massive. So, one of the conversations that Scott and I are having is: so he drives a Ram 3500 with a long bed and a 20 foot trailer. So the conversation is: can we get it all on? I think it's a 22 foot bed. Can we get all of this on a 22 foot bed? And here's the other problem with it that we're going to have to figure something out. It sits significantly higher than the deck over trailer does. So trying to get that Bobcat MT-100 we were talking about earlier up on a taller bed, like it can happen, but is it a sketchier situation? Do we have to get longer ramps to try to get it up on the bed safely? I don't know. To be determined, I guess. Or he says, I do like diesel. They'll last 200,000 miles. But by then, the body shows wear and tear, and they need to be switched out around 100,000. Yeah, so I'll have to go look at the mileage on Scott's truck. But I want to say it's probably 60,000, 70,000 miles, something like that. And it needs a new bed, and uh, it is it is showing its age. But it's low mileage, like I said, because they make two trips a day, three if they've got two two small jobs. So I don't know. Jonathan Flores, hey, dude. Hello. I'm watching your videos, getting ready to set poles for my fence patio roof. Thanks for your effort. Jonathan, I appreciate it. I, I'm always happy to help. Let us know if we can let us know if we can be of any assistance. Ken says, diesel's hard to fix, but we love them. Gas seems to be a good answer for what we're doing. I'm torn, too. So that, that, that yes, absolutely. So we don't service... We have a we have a repair shop that services all of the all of our vehicles. They we like them because they have a fleet side, uh, so we get serviced with like the ambulances in town with the big fleet. View. We don't have a massive fleet. We've got a handful of vehicles, but we get treated like one of these larger fleets to where we just schedule a day and a time. The guys roll it. They already have. They we tell them what we know what we think we're going to need: oil change, fuel filters, water separators. They have all of them on hand. They roll the truck in, put it up, do all the normal stuff. They'll do a walk around, main, you know, like a maintenance look or whatever, a maintenance inspection to see if there's anything else. And then they'll give us a list. Hey, your brakes are at X percent. You probably need to think about this in the next two or three stops or you know, two or three visits. Here's this. Here's that. Here's the other. This is your maintenance schedule. Here's where we are on the maintenance schedule. All this comes to me in an email. And, but for the guys, they, they roll in. It's like a NASCAR pit stop. They get it done. They get these guys back on the road. I like it a lot. Um, other guys have maintenance on staff, and which also makes a lot of sense because uh, maintenance can be done after hours to where we're not even – which would make sense because when we, we schedule a half day for this truck to be down, sometimes it's a full day because then they can also take the trailer for hub maintenance or you know the axle bearings or whatever. Um, so we'll schedule a full day typically. So we lose the day. So having it done in-house on site might save us, you know, if this thing gets serviced three times a year, might save us three days a year. Maybe that makes sense. I don't know. All right, there we go. Cor Corey says Chevy is the W4500 for the kind of the cab over uh, flat flatbed type chassis. Interesting. Roger says, "Deaf is essentially horse urine. Thank you, EPA, for that lunacy. I don't... If that's true, Sarah's got horses. So, I don't think it works that way, but maybe it does. No, I know it doesn't. But, uh, so, well, I'm, this show is not going to be that conversation about who owns the, uh, the major deaf in the United States. But there is a conspiracy afloat about the death situation in the United States. Uh, CNS says F-350s, except for my little truck. I drive a Chevy Colorado. So that's 
I always go back and forth on this. So I had at the Sarah, the, the Sarah, the truck that Sarah drives right now is my old 20. I have a Ram 2500 diesel uh, Cummins uh, that then, but I realized like this is more truck than what I need. I don't haul heavy things often. I'm going to get a half ton truck. We're going to save the 2500 for a fleet truck. I got the a Ram 1500 to tool around town. Did great. And the fuel efficiency is much better than 2500. Now, the 2500 is not really built for efficiency. It's got a little bit of a lift. It's got 35 inch tires. It's It was not built for efficiency, but half ton truck was. So it was great to drive around. But then we sold the stainless steel van because we got an enclosed trailer. We didn't need a dedicated vehicle for it. We needed something that we could take on jobs occasionally. Most of the stain work we have, we contract out the actual stain application. So we needed a platform to clean fences. It's something that in our area, soft washing isn't as much of a thing. Uh, it's a lot of pressure. So we built out a trailer, an enclosed trailer, still have it. Um, but I had this half ton truck. And by that time, we brought Sarah back on the team to run residential. She is in the 2500. She also has horses and horse trailers that need a heavier duty truck to pull them around. She got 2500. I had the 1500. Totally fine. My dad had a 1500 because he tools around doing sales and project management as well. Um, but then we had this trailer. And the trailer, trailer, trailer is significantly heavy. Um, just because we're we're toting around, it's like uh, ninety gallons of SH because anything over hundred gets you in a little bit of hot water as far as placarding and you know hazmat hazardous waste. Not, not going to broke ninety gallons of SH, and then I think it's like a two hundred fifty gallon uh, water tank. Then we've got soap tanks and the rest. If this thing's fully loaded, it is heavy. The half-ton truck isn't even going to touch it. So, dad's half-ton truck was older than mine. We took it into the dealership, traded it up for another 2500 which is the truck I drive now. But we're not cleaning a ton of fences. So, the the it gets used once a month for its actual intended purposes, which is hauling heavy stuff. The rest of the time, it's driving me around to projects. So, I'm with CNS that Chevy Colorado could be where it's at now if tesla ever gets their situation figured out been on the list for like two years for one of these cyber trucks a little bit excited about this because it, it could be like the best of both worlds it's supposed to have massive towing capacity but because it's electric super efficient also maintenance is nearly non-existent kind of the batteries but i don't know we'll see i almost I don't know. I'm almost thinking like a, a sedan would be perfectly fine for sales project management, but you have to get past the optics of it, right? I think it might be weird to see a fence professional pull up in a sedan. That might be a weird look. That being said, uh, there's a really major fence company over on the West Coast um, that exclusively drives Tesla sedans. So... Maybe it's not an optics thing. I don't know. I've always thought a, a, a trades professional should show up in a pickup truck because that's, I guess, what's been drilled in my brain for years and years and years. I don't know. I'm willing to hear a conversation on this. I mean, I think I think this is probably a conversation a lot of folks are having, especially right now with the vehicle market the way it is. Uh, we can't – right now, we look, we're look. we we're going to add another fleet truck to – to the team here just so we could have another option for putting another crew together but finding a cabin chassis we prefer ram a cabin chassis ram 3500 right now is just good luck I mean, it's just not out there again it says good conversation our average age is 15 years for our work trucks throwing money at them lately need to do something with the last with at least a couple of them we've we did that. So when my granddad had the company, especially, I couldn't even tell you what the average age, like these trucks were seventies and eighties models trucks. Um, my dad bought the company and, and modernized the fleet a little bit. Um, right now I'm trying to think 
I think right now our oldest truck is a 2016 or so because I got tired. So I got tired of exactly Ken, what you're talking about is throwing money at trucks because you're throwing money at them to fix them, repair them, replace transmissions, whatever. But that truck also now has downtime and downtime is incredibly expensive. You either have an additional vehicle that takes the place of that vehicle while that vehicle is down. So now we've got two vehicles, not super efficient. I don't know. So 15 years, it, our plan was going to be five years, five years on a vehicle, five year turnaround. We can depreciate it over five years. Technically they're heavy enough. We could depreciate them faster. You know, we could anyway, five years is kind of our, what was our thought. And then 2000, like I said, 2016 is the oldest. So then 2021 rolled around. We're not finding, you know, cabin chassis, 3,500 trucks. So we're getting a little bit more age out of our fleet now, but all of our, which is kind of good for our numbers. We had bid replacing these things last year. We'd, re, we'd bid replacing one this year. We haven't replaced them. We're still getting good use out of it. So I don't know. Anyway, CNS says we had the F-250 with the 6.2. It's just a big grocery getter. Traded it on another 350 and bought the Chevy Colorado. I like it. That. I, I like the idea of putting people who don't need heavy vehicles in efficient vehicles. Uh, that's, I think that, especially with the price of fuel, whether it's gasoline or diesel, where it is right now, and oil for oil changes and all the rest of it. I mean, it makes sense to figure out who can be in an efficient vehicle and put them in an efficient vehicle. But they all have 200,000 on them was 300,000 miles. Getting the life out of these vehicles. I love it. I agree on the sedan deal, but Kristen kills it in her blue Kia sedan. <laughs> so th that's the thing is like, maybe some of this is head trash, right? Maybe, well, I mean, and we both know like Sean King has sedans. Granted, chrome wrapped and they are slick. Um, so maybe this whole Fencing professionals half or pro trades professionals in general have to drive trucks is nonsense anyway. Um, I don't know. Something to ponder. Um, yeah, I would probably if I'm trying to think how often I use it as a truck. Not often. Um, now I've got a topper on it so that when I do put stuff back there, it can stay dry. Yeah. But on a day like today, I don't. I haven't seen him comment. I don't think my dad's watching. So uh, today's his birthday, and I'm going to go buy him a grill, and it's not going to fit in my truck with this topper on it. So I'm going to actually, speaking of the Isuzu, go take the Isuzu to the grill shop, pick up a grill, and uh, handle it that way. But So also, I wouldn't be able to do that with a sedan. But to be fair, I can't do that with my truck either. So, okay. We'd be in the same thing. Sedans might be the way. Might be the way for those that can use it. In regards to trucks, Ken, I've blown up motors on Ram 5500 twice and Ford 550 one time. So, so is what you like. I personally like Ford 550s, 13 foot of flatbed works well for a crew and materials per day. I, I think you're right. I don't think crew vehicles, I don't think we'll ever get away from having like the flatbed. I mean, it just makes too much sense. Um, And we're, I know where two Ram 3500 chassis are right now. If you're serious, brand new crew cab, send me the info, Ken. Uh, send me that information. I'm, I'm looking at everything right now. We are, I mean, we're trying to figure out do we add a crew? Do we add another crew right now? Um, I mean, we have the workflow for it right now. Uh, we haven't seen, we've seen a slight decrease in calls and, in, in, you know, leads coming in. Part of that could be heat. I mean, it's been, we've had 100 degree heat indexes for the last month or so. So not a lot of people in their yards, right? Not now on the commercial side, I think there's a little bit of wait and, wait and see game going on right now, just in regards to the economy. But send me that info though. I'm, all, I'm willing to look at whatever. If nothing else, we might be able to buy them, bring them here and sell them, make a little bit of money because there are absolutely none here right now. CNS says it's a, it's an optics thing. On the West Coast, you're expected to drive electric vehicles. And that probably is what's going on there, too. Um, it doesn't hurt that they're like 
something like within an hour drive of the Tesla. What, what do they call that? Gigabit factories or Gigafact? I don't know. Whatever Tesla factories. Josh says three three out of four of ours are diesel. So vote for diesel. I don't. Yeah, I mean you can't beat the longevity, the hauling capacity, and all that of diesel. That's why we have them. I, I don't know how often we use them at that capacity, right? How long, how often are they underutilized? So then are we paying, you pay more for the platform, more for the maintenance, more for the fuel, uh, but are they underutilized? Are we overpaying for the same, getting the same result? But that one time where you can't do something because you could have done it with the, with the diesel platform, if you, first time you need to haul a piece of heavy equipment, to you know i don't know these are the dilemmas folks divine fence we had a lot of diesel trucks and now prefer gas isuzu npr or hino trucks i know we'll look that up here in a minute we try our best to avoid our guys pulling trailers unless they have to for the equipment or if needed due to space i so our trucks are, are kind of standard with trailers right now they they just all pulled 20 foot deck over trailers. Well, that's not true. We have a 16 foot trailer as well. Let me pull up what a high note. Riveting content. Hold with me for just a second. Oh, no kidding. Okay. So let me bring this to you guys. Uh, get rid of this screen share. Bear with me. Vince guy trying to do tech stuff. I know trucks. Here we go. All right. We're going to do this one. So it basically looks kind of like the Isuzu. There's some monster trucks in here, and I'm here for it. Um, check out this one. I know Dakar. It's the Dakar off-road, so hmm, interesting. But so this is kind of what this is kind of what we're talking about though, right? That deck over cabin chassis truck. I have never heard of the Hino brand though. Is I mean it looks like they're used overseas quite a lot. But this really is kind of what we're talking about. Well, this is a dump bed, so that's not really what we're talking about. This thing would be cool for a pinch truck. So this looks almost exactly like our in or like our Suzu NPR. I mean, if you were to put a 22 foot bed on this or whatever, this would be this would be our truck exactly. Scrolling for a few more ideas here. Does it have a crane on it? It has a crane on it. That is fit. This looks like okay. This looks like the trucks uh, D and J projects use. Now, there's are Mercedes, but it has a. This is a crane, but it has a grapple on it, um, to where they can load and unload stuff out of the bed, i.e., equipment. We're getting closer. That's why I don't think we'd use this for a work truck, but wild looking truck. I think we all know who would use that truck. Brand it really nicely get some attention check out this thing not a not not a fence truck but you know whatever um yeah all right you guys get the point oh found it that's the truck it's a 1975 hino kl340 okay we're gonna need to find this thing and uh it's obviously not here in the united states we need to import it but okay so research shall commence on where this thing is and where we can go get it all right, so riveting content, I'm sure. Hino trucks. Something we should be looking into. I don't know. Uh, now, servicing might be a thing. Hino is not a brand I'm familiar with, so I have to think they wouldn't have service centers. We do have an Isuzu service center here, um, so for parts and all that. But, I don't know. Uh, let's see. 
So that's not, not bad. So 3,500 cabin chassis, 74 plus a bed. Now they used to be 60, but right now in the current market, not a bad price. Especially knowing what we would get when we sold ours. Like we can still get really good money for the one we've got right now. Do you guys use brackets when there is a slope or do you guys toenail to the post? Do not, we do not toenail to post, but we also don't bracket. So um, we overlap. So the, our rails overlap the posts. Uh, now I have seen guys that now, because we don't do cap and trim, we don't do picture frame. We do pretty much run of the mill fencing. I've seen some guys that do some very nice custom work and some semi cut. I would call like cap and trim and picture frame semi custom. Um, maybe that's wrong. I don't know, but we stick with really simple stuff that we can just get through really quickly and that we know that we can put out an excellent result. Any one of our team members can make this fence look incredibly well. Privacy shadow box board on board are our three fences. So we overlap the two by fours. Um, so we don't use brackets or toenail. Not a massive fan of the toenailing idea. Now I caught flack on that, you know, opinion. Uh, what was it? Well, I won't use the name, but we did a review on someone's video who does not like reviews being done on their videos. Um, but he was using a system. Now he was using a deck board system on a fence, but where the screw kind of toenailed through the board, it was like a hidden fastener system. So toenailed through the board into the structure, um, I caught flack for saying that I didn't think that was as strong of a connection. And apparently, according to the YouTube world people, I'm wrong. Um, uh, that apparently is a very strong connection. I don't believe in it. I don't, I prefer face nailing or face screwing through the entire bulk of the two before into that post one guy's opinion, I guess. But anyway, um, how important is four wheel drive? Typically, a Suzu shouldn't go off road in our area. Not important to me because so for us, uh, that would be a snow and ice situation. But if if the buses don't run due to weather, our trucks don't run due to weather. If the school district has hired, you know, meteorologists, they have consulted everyone, they've driven the roads, they don't feel safe putting a bus with people's kids on it. I don't want to put a truck with those kids' parents in it. Right. So uh, down the road. So four wheel drive, not massive. I would have to ask Scott, but I would guess he's maybe, ne well, I don't want to say maybe never put it in four wheel drive. He did have a job out in the field once where I think he did. He, he brought this thing back filthy and I asked him about it. He's like, well, it was a muddy field and we about got stuck. And the owner said, uh, it is what it is. So how important is four wheel drive? I would say, Maybe not 0%, but 5% importance. I don't know. Very little importance in my mind, uh, four-wheel drive. It's another It's another part of maintenance, right? That transfer case is going to have a maintenance schedule attached to it. So Corey goes on to say, one nice thing about a pickup and a trailer is that we can have dump trailers and flat decks. Very good point. Uh, one can be in the yard being loaded for the next day. Newer pickup is 2200 a year for insurance, 50 for trailer. Fair point. Corey makes a great point here. Um, so trailers can be less expensive than having a whole new truck, um, but typically that trailer's being hauled by a truck, right? So we're not talking about uh, keeping the truck and buying another truck and getting rid of the trailer. We're talking about the truck being the trailer. Um, but fair point, though, that you can have dump trailers. So we would still probably have a dump trailer in this scenario um, for, you know, whether you're using it for haul off or, you know, fence removal, disposal. Um, I don't know. I tell you what we talked about, and I'm still, I'm still halfway interested in starting a dump trailer business. A buddy of mine started one in town and is doing very well with it. Uh, basically you drop these things off it's not really a dump trailer. So it's a trailer that hauls the uh, roll off containers, but drops them off in at people in people's driveways or in their yard or whatever they fill it up. He takes it to the dump and dumps it. Uh, but he also, the reason we would use it is for fence haul off. 
how easy would it be to drop a dump trailer or in this case a roll off to get filled up with all the fence scrap or whatever and then just haul it straight to the dump might be pretty easy now it would be more expensive because our current process is we bring it back stack it outside of the fence yard and then people just come take it they use it i don't know for what they use it for but and they will take almost anything it could be a fence where you look at it, you're like there is no value left in this fence and it'll be gone by midnight i almost guarantee it so we would have expense dumping it with the dump trailers where we don't have expense when people haul it off now uh, now that's not to say we couldn't just bring it back and stack it and have them haul it off but that kind of defeats the purpose of the dump trailer um but we could off here my thinking is we could offset the cost in this by renting them out as well for other people's you know dumping so i don't know camo said that is exactly what it was called um i wasn't gonna say what it was called but i am verifying that matt said that it is the uh, camo so at, i didn't say matt the og ladder says camo system very good it's exactly what it was uh, we use flatbed with trailers. Nothing like being able to haul your mini plus all the attachments and all the materials to the job site with one setup. Agreed. 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 And that's. I get it. And so maybe it's maybe it's mix and match, right? Maybe we've got a few flatbeds with with tra with deck over trailers, and we also have Susie NPRs for jobs that don't require that. You know, so maybe it's mix and match. Matt said, I just did a repair last week on a fence. that had toenail two by fours, and they certainly needed repair. Definitely not the best route to go if you can help it. I agree, Matt. I agree. Is I do not believe that toenailing is anywhere near as strong as face nailing or face screw, you know, whatever. Nail or screw, not in this discussion, right? Uh, face, face attachment has to be stronger than toenailing. I just firmly believe that maybe that's something we should test we set up like a test on that you think like a pull test or something like trying to pull it apart hmm. yeah we should do that uh dark brewery says should i build a fence to keep my neighbor from mowing my lawn no unless they're doing a poor job if they're doing a poor job and you prefer a pristine lawn you build that fence and you protect your yard. If they do an okay job and you're all right with it, dude, let them mow your yard. Why not? I don't know. Uh, this is the thing, right? So this is the neighbor discussion, but the neighbor is messing with your stuff. So here's, maybe you do, because uh, we've seen property line disputes based on where the mowing line was. Like, I have mowed this forever right here. Well, thank you, because the property line is four foot over. So you've been mowing four foot of my lawn for like the last 10 years or something. So, I mean, I appreciate that. But that doesn't hold weight when, you know, if we're talking about, you know, adverse possession, you know, trying to possess, trying to claim that land as their land doesn't really work like that anymore. In the state of Missouri, adverse possession used to be quite the thing. And it was more in terms of, if a cattle fence, so barbed wire ag fence had been in a particular place, and I believe it was like 15 years, more than 15 years, then that was determined to be the property line because no one disputed it in that 15 years. But surveying technology has come quite a long ways. It is what it is now as far as GPS. Fence lines do not determine boundary lines anymore, at least in the state of Missouri. We have to add that caveat because we're learning that things are different in different places. But in Missouri... Uh, fence rows do not play a role in adverse possession. Michael says, if you're doing a job for a client, can you explain how the money processing works? Do I pay for the whole project and my client pays me at the very end? Or does the client pay for materials right away? Depends where you are. Depends, depends what's normal. In our process, the client pays a deposit that is 50% of the project. Uh, then at the end of the project, the balance becomes due. Now, out of that deposit, most of the materials come from stock. You know, we'll, we'll hold them here. on. We're just taking them out of our inventory to put on their project. But 
in some cases, that deposit does cover the purchase of the materials and part of the labor. Now, it's only half the total, so it's not it's not going to cover all the materials and all the labor, obviously. So does the client pay for the materials right away? In our process, they kind of do because they do pay the deposit, right, by placing the deposit. And if it's a special order project, it allows us to place the order right then, lock the price in for those materials for this particular project. Uh, typically, what we'll do also is even when we're pulling from inventory, when we receive the deposit, we will separate those materials from our inventory so that we don't resell them because we know we sold them at this price today. I would hate to bring in another inventory load of additional materials at a higher price and end up using those more expensive materials on the project that got sold at a lower price. Uh, that's how the money processing works right now. Um, there's another interesting concept out there that will, this conversation would have to wait until later for that to be announced. But as of right now, now there are some people that will tell you they do not collect deposits, that they cover all of the costs until the project is done and then the client pays them. That works for some people. And it, with a strong enough contract, it probably works. For us, the deposit is the client having a little bit of skin in the game, just like we do. We've invested in this inventory sometimes months ago. We've paid for it a while ago. We've paid for it to sit on our lot and wait. We took the risk. The client then put some skin in the game by placing a deposit with us. Now, it could be that, that for whatever reason, the client decides that they want to go with another contractor. Then we simply give the deposit. We refund the deposit. There's not a holdback. There's not restocking fees there's there's some games people can play with numbers um that's our process now there's likely other people watching that have a different process but you you ask for mine process and that's what that's what ours is all right 14 minute warning on watching the new video strong says how do you guys do your post when you have odd shaped lots and the angle for the corners can't be 90 degrees that that's probably well that's a fair amount of what we do so for whatever reason we have a ton of cul-de-sacs here and cul-de-sacs obviously cannot have square lots they're all pie shaped um so uh, i guess it depends on the type of fence you're building i mean wood fence and chain link not a problem i mean even with vinyl you can uh, depends on how extreme the angle is, but with a router, you can enlarge the holes to make it go from 90 to a larger or smaller angle, depending on which side of the post you're looking at. Um, not as tricky as you would think. And if we're talking about ornamental, like an ornamental steel, they actually make swivel brackets that will allow you to go from 90 to you know, whatever, 120 or something like that. Um, depends on the type, what type of fence strong are you uh, interested in building or are you thinking about building or having built for you? I would probably help answer the question a little bit more. Uh, I'm guessing it's probably something ornamental. Like I said, chain link wood doesn't really matter what the angle is. Uh, well, I guess with wood, you would, you would still, depending on the angle, you could still modify the rails or the post to accommodate it. Uh, chain link uh, trying to think this through. Chain link really doesn't care at all. I'm trying to think of a situation where angle would play a role, but I mean, I, I really don't think it would change anything at all. All right. Dark Brewery says his neighbor mowing his grass is horrific. Then build the fence. That's what I say. Protect your lawn. Do you say no to horrific lawn mowing? CNS Vinyl, all of our trucks are four-wheel drive for the simple reason that helps it helps keep from tearing up yards when we have to go in the yard. That's fair. Uh, probably a regional thing, I would guess. Um, so all our standing rule, unless there is a very clear exception, is that the trucks and trailers stay at the curb. They don't, even if the truck is not pulling a trailer, stays. So, for example, when I'm going to project manage, or Sarah's going to do a console on site. So we've received the deposit. We've received the or contract. Sarah's going to do the final consult to verify layout and all that. Even if we're not pulling a trailer, we stay at the curb. That is the rule. 
Do not pull in the driveway. Do not, unless there is a clear exception, right? Unless there is no on on road parking or off road, whatever curbside parking. Um, especially not in New York. Now I say that the four wheel drive. The time Scott did have to use four wheel drive, there was a clear exception in that it was a massive fence. They had field all around, so the client suggested that we take the truck around to the back rather than haul all the materials back and forth. Um, in our area, rarely, rarely would we go in the yard, but in a situation where that's normal, I could absolutely see four wheel drive coming into play because you're not relying on the rear wheels, which are the lighter wheels to try to propel that vehicle through the yard. Absolutely makes sense. All right. 10 minute warning to the, to the preview of this week's video. I got to change my screen share around off the high note trucks. That's just a kind of a fun word to say anyway. Uh, let's see. We put a fence in a store, which is the title of this week's deal. So we've got that ready to go. All right. Should we? All right. Let's do last minute. Quite not last minute. We are. We still have. We still have another half an hour. We are getting kind of close. I guess we do this at noon because it's an easy time. But maybe we do these like midway through. Moving. Yeah, that's true. We've had a really good discussion today, and I really appreciate it. Yeah. It's true. Yeah, next week, next week's is a little bit longer one. So maybe, maybe we uh maybe we do these at eleven. There we go. That because then if it is a longer one, because these next few are kind of trending longer. So I don't know. We'll see. All right, uh, let's see. Make sure we're caught up. I believe we are. All right, we'll do some last minute, not last minute questions, but I don't want to get into explaining the contest either because that would be longer than nine minutes that we currently have. Uh, I don't know. What do we do? So I think we just wait and see if there's any questions or comments in the meantime. And then at 12 o'clock on the dot, we roll this thing because what I'd hate to do, I say this enough to 12 o'clock, someone leaves and then comes back at 12 o'clock. And this is already, done. this week's is a short one. So we will be done by 1209 if we start at 12 o'clock. So they leave, they come back. They're like, ah, we already did it. Nah. Well, wait a minute. Joe told me 12 o'clock and I came back at 12 o'clock. He's already done. So what is going on? Are you, Braden, are you watching the YouTube stream? Is it clean and clear? Okay. I just clicked over to the live stream tab on the computer and it is not clean. It's like blurry. So. Okay. It's just a YouTube like analytics thing. Anyway, not to bore you guys. Guys, appreciate you guys showing up. If you guys are watching on YouTube, give it a like. If you're watching on Facebook, give it one of the, uh, what do we call them? reactions i, I want to say emotional feedback but that's not really accurate um because liking on facebook now doesn't have nearly as much impact as it used to now they want you to get feedback through like the heart or the hug or the laugh or the cry whatever choose one of those i'm not here to judge let's do that let's see who has liked and hearted this particular broadcast so far adam sims and michael babbitt have given it the thumbs up thank you gentlemen and michael taylor and the fence industry industry podcast have given it a heart thank you gentlemen now this is only on facebook youtube doesn't give me really good feedback on who's liking the content if you haven't subscribed already now would be a fantastic time to if you're watching on youtube a fantastic time to subscribe right here there is like a button click that one uh, that would be fantastic if it's red if it's red you click it that means you haven't subscribed yet or all right so i watch this other channel and i i believe him but it kind of doesn't make sense because he's saying people who have subscribed to him in the past have gone back and watched and realized that they're no longer subscribed to him so maybe some people have been unsubscribed which doesn't make a lot of sense even 
to the platform you're watching on, it wouldn't make any sense. Like, there's no motivation to unsubscribe people. So maybe it's people that have made new YouTube accounts went and found and realized those. Anyway, if you're watching this and you're enjoying it and you're not subscribed, please consider subscribing. I can't technically, I don't think I'm supposed to ask you to subscribe. I think I can ask you to consider subscribing if you find the content that I'm producing valuable. All right, where are we at? We're at five minutes, four minutes, five. We're getting super close. All right, so Sydney wants to know, what do you do with a customer who keeps wanting to change spacing of posts on a wood rail fence? On wood rail, the spacing really is the spacing, right? If we're talking about a post rail, well, even if we're talking about split rail, as long as it's not the stacked rail, like those fences, I don't know, they can be whatever. But, um, I mean, the spacing is the spacing. It's going to be your rails come at a pre-cut, pre-doweled length or split rails, a pre-notched length. Um, the spacing really is the spacing. Uh, I mean, especially if you're already in the middle of building it, it is what it is. And especially if, if your work order or if your proposal didn't call out a spacing in it, the client didn't specify space before you started. It is what it is. It's typically, typically eight feet, a little bit shy of eight foot on center. Um, that's kind of unusual. I don't know that I've come across a client like that. So it might be, they might just have unique ideas on things in general. Uh, this client. So I don't know. That is kind of weird. So have you started the project and they're finished or they're trying to change it mid project or are we still in the proposal phase? If we're still in the proposal phase. That's easy enough to fix because you just price it to where it's no longer attractive. Um, now this actually, so this came up last week too about change orders. Um, you could just start calling them change orders, right? So especially if you're mid project, you know, in order to change it, we've got, you know, a, a project. There's some people that have change order fees that say, hey, it's $150, $250 a change order in order to provide changes. We can do that, but it does cost every time you make a change, maybe something like that. But yeah, just, okay. So they said, she said, I have one now mid project. If that project has started, is it? it is what it is. And if it's not spelled out, I guess maybe moving forward, you do spell it out in your scope of work, in your proposal. Um, but if the customer didn't specify before the project was started, then it kind of is what it is. They come pre, the, the post and rail systems we've dealt with, the po the rails come pre-cut and pre-doweled to fit into the dowels that, uh, that the posts have. I don't know, that's kind of weird. I hope that helps. I wasn't really an answer though. Strong says it's just a normal wood fence, but yeah, some of the angle are wide and some of them are acute. And I'm trying to figure out how to do the four before post corner so that the rails hit the post correctly. Okay. So really, I mean, really what you could do on that four before, luckily wood is fairly forgiving as far as angles go. Um, you could split the difference of that angle with your post so that the post wouldn't be 90. It would, if it's more acute than that, then you could just rotate the post so that, now it would be a little bit more, and you're you're making me remember my geometry terminology here, but it'd be more obtuse. Is that it? Acute and obtuse angles. That sounds right. Um, so you would basically split the difference on the post if it's really if it's if it's not massively acute or obtuse, then you could you can get away with just having it set normally and then just adjusting your rails. Uh, but if it is a significant difference, then you can split the difference of that angle with the post. You could just adjust the post to where both of the rails coming in are a little bit off angle and still be perfectly fine. If you want to feel even better about it, you could use screws to make sure that it's not going to move on you long term. Roger says, man, I'm shirking on my duties. Do not forget to hit the thumbs up button. Roger. I was mean to talk to you about it offline, but since you brought it up now, please please do not shirk your thumbs up duties. Okay. We'll just leave it at that. I uh, see. And says last minute question, editing software. Uh, Adobe is what we use. Uh, Premiere pro, right? Yeah. Premiere pro. 
it's what I started with and I just kind of like, so it's what we just continued using. Um, a lot of guys use like Final Cut Pro too. Like that's a thing, right? DaVinci Resolve is another one Braden's looked at. But Premiere works. So maybe maybe we're changing, which is perfectly fine. But uh, Premiere Pro is just, we already had the Adobe suite because we were doing some picture editing for marketing pictures. So Premiere Pro was already loaded in there and we just kept on using it. Um, but yeah, it's just what I, 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 I didn't try DaVinci. So I tried Final Cut Pro. I did like a trial of it or something and I couldn't figure it out you know, within the free trial, you know, where I was proficient at it. So Premiere Pro is where that went. All right. What time is it? 12 o'clock on the nose. Let's do this. So then we can get in. After this, we're going to get into the contest. Pretty short, nine minutes or eight minutes and 57 seconds. It's not every day we're putting construction fins inside a warehouse. Speaking of the Isuzu NPR. Today I will be taking over the shop from Matt. And I will be making a 24 foot roll gate. Hopefully I can do it in one day. So we still have the manual notcher uh, for making our notches. I We've looked at uh, the notching machines. We've gone back and forth on them. So Matt, who's been in the chat here, is our lead fabricator. He's basically our on-site supervisor, which means uh, fabrication, building in grounds. If it's on the Ozark Fence property, it kind of falls under his purview. We've talked about uh, buying a a motorized notcher. I don't know what, I don't know what the term for those really is, but um, we never have pulled the trigger. The investment's a little bit high for what we get, and especially that the manual notcher works fairly well, probably because we're not notching heavy wall consistently. Now, when we do cantilever gates, actually, um, actually the two and a half heavy, we don't notch anyways. So two inch heavy, I guess we will notch, but we don't notch it enough to where the investment seems worthwhile. Um, but I don't know. So we still use the manual notchers, but this you'll notice this thing's got the padding on it because I've been knocked in the head a few times with that thing. As you're pulling it down, it can really like, once it shears, it shears. So foam padding for safety should be at least your top three, the top three. For sure. <laughs> I like how Eric makes random appearances too. I think I think he has like a sixth sense on when cameras are recording, and he just like perks up. He's like, "Oh, gotta go out to the fab shop real quick." <laughs> See, look, there's Braden becoming a fence guy. There you go. So Matt says the notcher is nicknamed the skull crusher. Not wrong. Not wrong. That thing, it is solid steel. And when it hits you, it, you absolutely know it. Those little, the bear claws, let me back up. Uh, let me back up here just a second. 
These bear claws, these tools are just handier than anything I've had, anything I had when I was in the fabrication shop. Uh, now, full transparency, we sell them. So, you know, maybe somebody says it's a sales pitch, but they really are freaking handy. Uh, they are really nice at, now you saw that he had tightened the wire, cut it, ran the tension bar. Now he's placing the bands. So when they lock, when they tighten, they also lock in to where you're not worried about that thing blowing out again when you're trying to put your nuts on your bolts and all that. Now, while John was wrapping up that big slide gate, Eric had to scoot out to Bass Pro Shops to repair some temporary fencing we put up a little while ago for him. Was he... Was the Isuzu? This is also while the Isuzu was out, I guess. Yeah, it must have been. Yeah. So um, we are the Springfield is the world headquarters of Bass Pro Shops. This is they also have this massive aquarium called Wonders of Wildlife. And it's, I think technically it's not part of Bass Pro. Wink, wink. But. It is on their property and it is majorly funded by like some subsidiary or something. Uh, but it was it was rated number one aquarium in the United States by uh, by uh, USA Today, so it's pretty legit. Anyway, this is a laydown lot for, and they might talk about it, but this is a laydown lot for some. They've got an ongoing. They've got a project that wonders the wildlife. They're putting a massive LED screen on the side of it, uh, so this is a laydown lot that does not want to stay up. Fixed. Now that one, now that foot's broken, though. Yeah, so we'll, replace, we'll have to replace that one, which I don't know if it'll even fit. So those just get bashed, like, when, they, when they're loading in materials then? Okay, so this wasn't even wind. This is probably, I would guess, when these materials were brought in, they, uh, they got into the fence a little bit. I mean, I guess it did before, right? Yeah, well, me and Matt had to kind of uh, talk about it. We're here at an undisclosed location. It's Bass Pro. Setting up, fixing, I guess, some panels. That have fallen. Yeah, I like it was undisclosed for about half a second. Very good, very good. Falling over. Looks like we broke a foot off here. And we're missing some sandbags. So basically, we're just going to set them back up, replace this foot, throw some sandbags in here. So we had to go back to the shop to get more sandbags because we didn't bring them because who would have thought someone stole sandbags from a parking lot? I mean, that's kind of weird to steal sandbags, but whatever. That's like the number one stolen thing from Tim Fences is sandbags. It's, what do you do with a 50 pound sandbag? They're like, where do these things go? I don't. Oh, yeah, we're not going to. Eric has some ideas, apparently, but that we will not be talking about. All right. How'd it go? It went fantastic. Super easy. Looks fantastic. We're basically the greatest finches of all time. Me and Braden. 
Yeah, it's pretty good. We put more sand on there, which mainly the reason that it fell over is we were out of sand. I finished the roll gate and I think it turned out pretty good. Probably better than Matt's. <laughs> oh, good. All right. Another day wrapped up. Now, on Thursday, the guys had some unconventional work to do. It's not every day we're putting construction fence inside a warehouse. What was the purpose of this fence? Just keep people uh, out of the inventory? Gotcha. Keep them out of the inventory then? Or, yeah. So so these kind of companies are like popping up here like crazy. I don't know if they're like this everywhere, but so it's like these bin. It's called bin crazy, but bin digging. Yep. Yep. So, oh, that's what this one's called? Bin digging? Got it. Um, so basically you could go through like all of these like bins, which are just totes of stuff that, you know, it's either overstock or it's like returns or it's all sorts of stuff from these big, you know, online retailers that then this company goes and buys like by the ton brings in, puts on the floor, then people will then just go through them. And then I think they, pay, what, what? There's, it depends, but some of the ones, some of the business models that that you like pay by the pound or something um, based on what you buy. So they're like, hey, we paid X amount a ton for it. So we're going to mark it up a little bit. You pay X amount per pound to where if you get, I don't know, it gets kind of crazy. Um, so Candace, who is our retail wholesale rock star, which you guys are going to see in a few weeks. Oh, you've seen her already, but we're going to talk about she comes into one of the videos in a few weeks. Um, she is massive. Like she has a business that kind of revolves around this type of business. So she is, and we should talk to her about these because it, it's a whole crazy business model. So the panel on the left is a new, new to us Z and D panel um, by Master Halco, or distributed by Master Halco. Um, the one on the right are panels that we build uh, just here in the fabrication shop. Uh, we could we bought them from Z from Master Halco. The Z and D panels from Master Halco cheaper than what we are manufacturing the panels for. Um, so we're kind of interested to see how they want how they end up. Let me know if you guys. Use Z and D panels. Um, so Divine has a point. So they use the rubber bases for temp fence. We had better luck with them not breaking. That's a fair point. We've talked about this. We go back and forth. We've used those in the past, like the compressed rubber, fairly heavy, so that they don't tip or anything like that. Um, they didn't hold up long term for us, though, and it very well could have been stored, like how we're storing them or something like that. But they started after they'd been out in the sun for a while, they started getting brittle and kind of like crumbling at the edges. And then over time, as they were loaded on truck, unload and unloaded off the truck, they would break in the middle because they would, they'd have the holes in the middle to where the feet stuck in them. I mean, we're, I'd be willing to look at them. Um, Cause the nice thing about the, the bases that we use right now is we also build them. So we can also fabricate them from, you know, 
tear out, you know, if we have a bunch of inch and five eighths heavy tear out from an old commercial job, we can slice that thing up and create our own bases uh, with some rebar or sucker rod or something like that. So we can kind of make them ourselves versus buying them. Um, but you also then have to use sandbags, which as we're learning are a theft item on these construction jobs. Uh, Divine says we use the Z&D panels and love them. Very good. I'm, we so far we've really liked them. We bought a truckload of them, so we've got quite a few of them sitting right now. But uh, construction fence is on the rise for sure. Now Matt and John had to do a little custom work. They had to lengthen one of the ornamental steel panels so it would fit really nicely into two already placed masonry columns. Now, the reason we had to do the fabrication is because Mr. Fence Tools hasn't created a panel stretcher yet. Here's looking at you, Sean. They they do make really nice tools, and that was just me kind of like, they make all sorts of tools for all sorts of different things. <laughs> and I was sitting there, I was like, we need a panel stretcher. I'm like, that sounds like something that uh, Mr. Fence would come up with. Like John's building some gates. Most of them were like seven foot apart or something. Okay. These concrete columns, and they're going to put these in between the columns. But these particular sections of the columns were too wide, and they were wider than what an original panel is. Okay. So we had to somehow make the panel wider. So to avoid having to mess with the pickets, I decided to just add. I think it was like six inches. So I decided to put three inches on this side and three on this side. Okay. That way it still kind of looks like it came from the factory somewhat. So it was actually a little more difficult than I thought it was going to be or that I hoped it was going to be. Um, but at the end of the day, I think they look pretty good and they're both evenly spaced on each side and the pickets are relatively uniform. So I think it turned out pretty good. And that's it. I didn't press stop, so I guess. Got it. Got it. <laughs> okay. Cool. It just ends. I like, well, so that's kind of a conversation we're having too when we're looking at like drop off. Is like when we start doing the that's a wrap. Thanks for watching. That that's where. Yeah. Yeah. It. I understand it because when you look at ours, like you start seeing the drop off when it's like, all right, guys, well, let me know what you think in the comments below. Be like, next, not watch to the end. I've already seen the content, so I'm out. All right, well, let me know what you guys think. That is this week's week in the life video. We're having a lot of fun making them. Uh, trying to show you guys a little bit of behind the scenes. The walkthroughs, is that next week's video? Nice. Next week's video is a, uh, I don't think we can it's a walkthrough of the company also we do a little bit like of the facility the ozark fence building and kind of the building and grounds it was wildly hot that day too <laughs> like i said it's been it's been 100 degree temperatures 110 heat index for like the last three weeks it's been really wild uh, but that's coming up next week we also have um 
what else we also do a kind of a walkthrough on the shipping process of a fitting sort of thing is that next week or week after oh <laughs> maybe it's the week after i don't know <laughs> uh we did film it we did see that's the thing is like from my perspective i just know it got filled like when is it like oh it's not oh okay well that's all right that meant, that's okay Braden. you're not gonna hurt my feelings by cutting out my content it's okay no it's uh anyway we got that stuff coming up i i hope you guys are liking it. i really do also we could use feedback on this too like if you guys if there's a particular part of this that you guys would like to see we've had some good feedback so far we're adding it to the list and trying to incorporate that in a week in the life video um we i'm here for it we're here for it we'd certainly like to hear it and mine says i will say it again can't say it enough i can't get enough of the day in the life format love getting to know more of your team and they all rock thank you i appreciate that i that that's one thing i enjoy is sharing our team members with you guys because i get to see i get to see them you know, every workday and interact with them. I like sharing that with you guys because there's some there's some really good people here, some really good characters. And I don't want I don't want that to seem negative, but uh characters is is the right word. They've got some fun personalities. Annie says, Hey. And it says, Can I get a shout out? Yes, consider yourselves shouted out. Hello, Annie. Joe says, I like the vids. Joe, thank you. I appreciate it very much. I We're enjoying the format. We really are. So, All right, let's talk about the contest really quickly because we've got nine minutes left in the show. We've got a little bit more than that, if we're being honest. But uh, this isn't a day where I've got a hard out, so that's always good. Let us do this, though. How? Hold one while I try to find the link to this. That's could have had that ready to go yeah it's in the description so i'll just click into that real quick yeah. and get an infinite audio loop here all right there we go so let's share this ah. yeah it's probably true probably true all right july youtube contest here we go all right so we're the contest. Uh, link is in the description, but also you can probably just drop the link um, in the comments. But so what it is, <clears throat> so we're trying to reward people that watch videos through the content, right? And the way this used to work is you would just put a, you would put a, a word or a catchphrase at the very end so that you had to listen to the whole thing. And if you did, you could get the word and then you could, but modern technology says you can just skip to the end, get the word, enter it. So we're going to start hiding these secret words. Uh, what is it? Or YouTube codes, not secret words in the YouTube videos. So for example, last week's video, I had said, you know, we were, we're trying to figure out are people watching the content throughout, you know, how many people are, how many people are and know it. So are people leaving this on screens and then just letting it run like through their day or whatever, which is fine. But we're trying, we asked you guys to enter the word end in the comment section uh, to try to gauge whether this is happening. And we got a lot of good engagement. It was like 30 some odd comments for yeah, 30, 30, 40 comments on this thing. It was crazy. So like, all right, so this is a thing. Let us, let's try to reward people for watching the content, right? And so what this, this contest is that to where you've got several ways of winning. So our having entries to win. So what it is once a month, we're going to do a giveaway for a hundred dollar Amazon gift card. We kind of played around with different prizes. Like, is it a, a gift card to one of our sponsors just to try to be a win-win a win for the viewer and also a win for the sponsor uh but then there were there would be some some of our viewers that are like from the diy sector so and like a nationwide gift card wouldn't really be as applicable now a stand seal gift card would be ac applicable to both diy and fencing contractor unless the contractor didn't do what and like unless it was 
a guy that only did chain link, right? Or as a DIY viewer that didn't have a wood fence. So we figured Amazon gift card is kind of the way. It's also really easy to distribute. So we did a YouTube uh, contest for an Amazon gift card. It was super easy. It literally emails the gift card directly. It's really super easy. So that's what we're doing. $100 gift cards. Theoretically, you could win if you were like, I don't know what the odds to this are, but you could win $100 a month for the next 12 months. Now, it's like a 0.000001% chance or something like that, I'm sure. But we're not ruling it out. We're not saying, you know, past winners are ineligible to win in the future. In fact, we're we're kind of incentivizing people to join the contest month on month. So as you guys see, so you could get three points or three entries simply for visiting the Joe Everest YouTube channel. You could win another entry by visiting the Joe Everest Facebook page, the group Facebook page. Uh, now enter the code for five points. So one of the more, one of the higher weighted or five entries by entering the YouTube code. Now, I don't mind telling you, we're far enough into this. There's not a ton of people watching. If you were to put end into the code, that would get you some entries. Uh, if you share the giveaway, you get an entry. Now, you also, if you do all of the, if you do all of the actions, you get 10 extra points. Now, on the first month, this isn't going to be as applicable, but moving forward in subsequent months, if you've already entered once before and you enter again, you get a bunch of bonus points just to keep people engaged in the contest. Anyway, let me know what you guys think. $100 Amazon gift card. Is it good? Is it not good? Should we reach out to sponsors about sponsor gift cards? Or what do you guys think? I'm really, We're really looking for feedback here. I'm not locked in on $100 Amazon gift cards. If that's what it is, totally fine. But if you guys have something of more value, I'd be happy to look into it. But... Let me know what you guys think. All right, guys, it is 1226, so we're about wrapped up. Also, we're going to work on the background color here because it's not orange, and it probably should be orange, but Jeremy and I have discussed this. We're working on it. So next month, you will see, I don't, we might be able to modify this one. This might be orange. Like By the time you guys are watching or listening or coming back to this, it could very well be orange. You never know. Uh, anyway, any last minute questions, comments, etc. Let me know below. Uh, or you can looks like Braden has entered the link into the chat. You guys could click on that. We're closing up to the end. I don't mind saying you can click away, go start entering to win. Uh, this goes through the end of the month. So July 30 or 31. I always get this wrong. End of the month. Last day of the month is 31 is when it goes to. So Joe says groovy on the Amazon. Perfect. Love it. That's what we were hoping was that it would, it would kind of resonate with more people. Joko says gift cards sound good or power tools. Thanks for your help. Well, and that's what we're hoping is that Amazon sells enough, just a wide variety of things. I mean, they even sell fence parts. You could even buy fence parts from Ozark fence on Amazon. If you really felt compelled. Um, but you, with an Amazon gift card, you could really use that. To your point, Chuggo, for power tools for really whatever you want. <laughs> Nathan says, give away a fence build. Probably would be more than $100, though. So I don't think we're going to build a free fence for a month for a year. Um, that would – what? there's a quote from – there's a quote from uh, a TV a TV series that I don't think we can mention, but it's like I will never financially recover from that. Like that would just not happen. Matt says hundred dollars on Amazon is a sweet deal. Good deal, good deal. This is what I'm hoping for. Vine says have a great weekend, Joe and Fence Fam. You should give away Ozark fence signs. So, yes. We, I have thought about, so we have a, we have an online store. We have a Shopify store, ozfence.store. So I'm thinking about putting an item on that store, which is a fence sign, uh, setting it at, this is the dangerous part, setting it at a zero cost, but the client pays shipping. 
the only problem with this is if like internet bots get a hold of this thing because that can be a thing uh so we need to figure out what i'm trying to do is figure out can we limit the amount of sales per customer on this like to like four or something like if you want four signs and you're willing to pay the shipping on it i'll send it to you it'll get processed like a normal order on the fulfillment side on the e-commerce side it'll be super easy for us to fulfill um but i'm trying to make sure there's a way of limiting this um let me take this down. Uh, but yeah, so Vine, I think I thought we sent you signs. If we haven't, I apologize. Send me a message. These we can get these sent out on Monday. Absolutely. I will send you signs, no problems, no questions asked. I just need you to message me an address and I'll get it to the e-commerce guys and we'll get that out to you ASAP. Can you also get what's that? Can you also give my son a shout out? Oh, got it. So, oh, uh, <laughs> what was the, uh, oh, oh, good. Okay. Yeah. I see why we banned that. I'm glad you caught that one ahead of time. So, all right. No making me say bad words on YouTube that would get me in trouble. Annie, just saying. She's been banned, so she probably can't hear that message. If that's even your real name, and I think we all know at this point that it's not, come on. I'm a fence guy trying to do YouTube stuff, and I don't need people messing with it, okay? Okay. I don't even, okay, anyway. Back on subject. Having a contest, trying to give you guys some money and reward for you watching the content, which helps us. So it's it's a win-win. We're trying to give back to you guys. We're trying to say thank you for sticking with us, helping us through this journey of YouTubes. So, guys, it's right at 1230. Um, yeah, so go join the contest. Go jump in on the contest. Enter to win. Um, yeah, and we'll, there's no no tricks or no gotchas involved. It's literally just... Sign up, and if and it's an automated winner picker, it's probably, it's probably not the name of it, but uh, where we just like automatically generate a winner, and it goes through and pulls out randomly and gives us the information. So that's kind of slick. We might see, hmm, might do that on a live, do a live winner pick. Yep, we're gonna do that. We're gonna do a live winner pick on the first saturday of the month because then because the contest goes through the last day of the month that following saturday we'll do a live winner pull so that you guys can uh, be part of the process so yeah all right guys about that time joe everest fence expert reminding you that good fences make good neighbors i'll see you next week